request. I want to welcome Director Shalanda Young, Director of Office Management and Budget. Ms. Young, thank you for being here. I've enjoyed working with you. You're, you uh, uh, are one of the most likable people uh, on Capitol Hill and in my experience in politics and, and kudos to you. So as I've said before, I like you a lot, but I don't like the president's budget and I'm going to, I'm going to outline that uh, with uh, respect, but uh, probably some sharp criticism. So, um, but I appreciate your service to our country uh, as a, a former staff person here on Capitol Hill and now as uh, in this very important job as the director of OMB. So welcome back to Capitol Hill and thank you for your time this morning. I'm gonna yield such time as I may consume for an opening statement. You just thought that was my opening statement. But uh, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read my statement. I just wanna talk to you. I wanna talk to my colleagues. I wanna talk to the American people. Um, the, the president says, and I wholeheartedly agree with him, uh, that budgets are more than just numbers on a ledger. They are a statement of values. They are a vision for this country. They are a set of policies. Um, and so when he says, show me your budget, I'll show you your values, I agree. I just say it a little differently. Show me your budget and I'll show you your beliefs. And I'm not gonna question his motives or your motives about uh, your beliefs and your values and the policies outlined in the budget. I'm simply gonna say that there's not a clearer or starker contrast between the president's beliefs and the beliefs of at least the folks, Republicans who serve with me on the budget committee. And so what the beliefs I'm talking about are the beliefs in the role of government in the lives of its citizens, the role uh, of government in solving the problems of our country, uh, beliefs in where we are, the conditions we're living in, and the cause and effect of the policies of this president over the last few years and beliefs, quite frankly, in what the president thinks the American people think about the last three years and the policies and the outcomes and the current conditions that people are living with. I've, the better way to say that is, if the president's gonna double down on the last three years, I gotta give him credit, and I mean this with, with all respect, he puts it on paper and he continues to stay committed to his beliefs on the policies that he has advanced over the last three years. Now, I would say it's disconnected from the American people and their reality and their needs and their desire for a different direction. I think it's disconnected from the pain that they're feeling, especially when it comes to their pocketbook and, um, and the inf record inflation, the interest the payments on their home, the payments on their car, the payments on the, we've got more consumer debt than we've ever had. We've got more credit card debt than we've ever had. People are taking more money out of their 401k than they ever have. I mean, it's a crisis. I know we all have a view of, of what's a crisis. And I hear a lot about the climate crisis from my Democrat colleagues. The folks in West Texas, and I can, I, I grant you, I don't, I don't travel as much around the country as I do my own district. But my folks uh, would say that, that the biggest crisis right now is the safety and security of their families because of the policies at the border and the flow of crime and criminals and drugs that threaten their neighborhoods, their families, and their friends, and their fellow citizens. And they would say their pocketbook and the cost of living, the groceries, the gas, their, their quality of lives. And that's why I think the American people, when you look at the polls and approval, and I don't put a lot of stock in, in polls, but I think it's representative of, of our citizenry saying, we want something wholly different. So here are some things I've taken away from the beliefs. Um, this budget suggests that the president and those who support the president believe that we should expand entitlements 
when we haven't even paid for the two most important, in my opinion, Social Security, Medicare, they're going to be insolvent, but we're creating more. Um, we have more people trapped, in my opinion, on dependency in the government than we've ever had because we don't have real consideration for work-capable people going back to work who receive assistance. And so we expand Medicaid, for example, I say we, the president, without consideration for the kind of work requirements that he supported when he was senator. There's an expansion of Obamacare subsidies to people that are making $400,000, even $600,000 because you all repeal basically the eligibility. And the studies showed during the IRA uh, or during the temporary ex expansion of Obamacare that more than half the people on there were above the 400% poverty level. So it's, you suggest, and the president suggests in the budget that he's going to use somehow the IRA drug price control savings, which was 100 billion last time, it'd be expanded to 200 billion in savings, that you're gonna use that somehow to shore up Medicare. That's a, listen, we ought to work together to shore up Medicare, no question. And kudos, I guess, to the president for at least outlining a way to do that. He grabs for a tax hike of about 750 billion and then this savings from the drug price control. I disagree with that strategy and that policy, but nevertheless, that's what's articulated. But here's my question. Why should we believe the president's going to do use those savings when the last time through the IRA, there were savings in Medicare that were used to subsidize green energy tax giveaways? It didn't go back into Medicare and shore it up. So you're saying things in this budget that in practice haven't been followed. Let me be clear. There are things that, the, that Republicans have said that we haven't followed on, up on. And we got a piece of paper that's very different in terms of our beliefs. I guess you could go back to the biblical admonition, show me the fruit of your works. Faith is dead and belief is dead without works. And let me tell you, there's as much deficiency on following through with our uh, balanced budget as, as some of the criticism I'm levying on you and the president. You, you understand? I'm trying to be an equal opportunity uh, a criticizer. Now, our budget's different. We don't leave 16 trillion or 17 trillion or 18 trillion in debt. We take that off over the next 10 years to balance. Y'all raise taxes $5 trillion at a time when our economy's teetering on recession, where a lot of those taxes would be passed in higher expenses to people, the exacerbating inflation. We don't use taxes. We try to reinvest and reignite growth through tax reform and regulatory reform, trade. So there are two different worlds, two different belief systems. And what I think I would summarize to say in closing is my Democrat colleagues and this president believe in more government and more spending and more taxing as the answers to the problems that our country faces. And I think that very strongly that our belief system articulated in our budget suggests that we believe in less government, less spending, less taxes, more empowerment of the American people, more freedom for a better quality of life, for prosperity that will raise all boats, that will give, that will create the greatest anti-poverty program ever known to man, which is more jobs, more opportunities, higher paychecks, better quality of life and standard of living. That's my perspective. I think, I think those uh, two worldviews, those two belief systems are as clear to the American people as you can get. And like I said, I respect that the president is, he's staying, not just staying with the horse that he's been riding on, he is galloping at a pace that we haven't seen yet, which is, uh, which I think will end in even greater disaster than what we've been experiencing. With that, I know I've gone over my time, but I'll let you have as much time as you may consume for the ranking member's opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to have you back here, uh, Director Young. You know, it's common uh, this time of year uh, in this cycle to hear the question, are you better off than you were four years ago? Well, four years ago today, then President Trump was busy tweeting out crazy conspiracy theories about COVID-19. By the end of the month, a million and a half Americans would lose their jobs. By the end of the following month, a record 20 and a half million Americans would lose their jobs. 
Many American families were stuck inside, probably like my family. I was on Zoom in a little office in my house, my wife teaching her second grade class from our dining room on Zoom, and our daughter, a kindergartner at the time, in her kindergarten class, sitting at our kitchen table. Most American families were worried about keeping ends meet and frankly, keeping their mental health. Well, let's look at where instead we are today. All of the jobs that were lost during COVID have been earned back and more. Unemployment has been below 4% for a record 25 consecutive months, the longest in more than a half century. In 2023, contrary to what we heard about supposedly teetering on recession, and despite the predictions of all the naysayers and doomsdayers, 2.5% economic growth, more than any other peer economy in the world. And inflation, it has cooled considerably. We are now almost at the Fed target and as was confirmed yesterday, as projected, the Fed will cut rates by 75 basis points over the course of this year. It has gotten so good, Mr. Chairman, that the center-right economist, out with this latest headline, America's pumped up economy. So when we consider the fact that this economy has come all the way back from the depths of where we were four years ago today, why in the world would we ever go back to where we were just four short years ago? Well, that is exactly where Republicans want to lead us. Just yesterday afternoon, and I appreciate the timing for this hearing today, the Republican Study Committee released its 2025 budget. Here's what they propose. Cutting Social Security by one and a half trillion dollars raising the retirement age, cuts promised to benefits for those who are currently paying into the system in your retirement age. Medicare, $1 trillion worth of cuts. It would end the Medicare guarantee and turn Medicare into a premium support system. Seniors would have to fend for themselves on the open market with nothing but a coupon to offset as much of the cost of the insurance as they could find. Medicaid, CHIP, and the Affordable Care Act cut by an additional four and a half trillion dollars. This is the Republican budget and what they plan to do if they were to gain full control here in Washington, DC. So Mr. Chairman, you're right, there is a stark and clear difference between the two visions. One is a vision that would take us back to the depths of where we were just four years ago. The other is a vision that has literally led the world in economic growth. I look forward to hearing more about the details of both of those visions today, and I look forward to your testimony here, Director Young. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, uh, ranking member from Pennsylvania, and uh, in the interest of time, if any other members have opening statements, I ask that you submit it for the record. I will hold the record open to the end of the day to accommodate those members who may not yet have prepared written statements. Now, I'd like to recognize Director Young. Again, thanks for being with us today. The floor is yours. I yield five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Arrington, Ranking Member Boyle, members of the committee. Uh, I'm going to say something and mean it that some witnesses may not mean. It's a pleasure being here with you today. It's a little like coming home. I uh, also want to thank the staff, as the chairman noted, I was a staffer uh, in the House for the Appropriations Committee and look at me in front of the Budget Committee, and I take anything bad about the Budget Committee I may have said uh, back, but it was certainly before Chairman Arrington and Ranking Member Boyle were heads of this uh, esteemed committee. Uh, you're right, today a lot of my remarks uh, will be about contrast, uh, where this president stands, uh, and I'm proud to present his fourth budget the fiscal year 2025 budget. From day one of this administration, President Biden has tackled challenges head on while delivering long lasting results. Over the past three years, he has overseen a strong economic recovery, amassed one of the most successful legislative records in generations, 
grown the economy from the middle out and the bottom up, and delivered important progress for the American people. Under the President's leadership, we've added about 15 million jobs. The unemployment rate has remained below 4% for over two years, a more than 50-year record, while inflation has fallen by two-thirds. This administration has taken action to lower costs for working families on everything from prescription drug costs and health insurance premiums to everyday goods and services. And the President's top priority remains lowering costs for hardworking Americans. At the same time, the President has also restored U.S. leadership on the world stage while keeping Americans safe and promoting democracy here and abroad. The President has delivered this progress for the American people, all while fulfilling his commitment to fiscal responsibility. The deficit is more than $1 trillion lower than when the President took office, thanks in large part to a strong economic recovery. In addition, the President has also enacted another roughly $1 trillion in savings over the next decade through the Fiscal Responsibility Act. The President's 2025 budget details the President's vision for a more equitable, prosperous, and powerful America with proposals for responsible pro-growth investments in the American people. The budget protects and builds on the progress made over the last three years and proposes additional policies to lower costs for hardworking families including for health insurance, prescription drugs, childcare, utilities, housing, college, energy, and more. These investments will help working families keep more of their hard-earned paychecks and strengthen our economy. It also invests in America and working families. President Biden has shown us that we can be both fiscally responsible and invest in America. The budget will bolster manufacturing and industry across the nation, make our communities healthier and safer, provide paid leave, support research in cancer, deliver for our veterans, cut taxes for families with children, promote a flexible and dynamic workforce, and more. The budget protects Medicare and Social Security, bedrock programs that generations of Americans have counted on and seniors have paid into their entire working lives. It extends Medicare solvency indefinitely by requiring wealthy people to pay their fair share toward Medicare and reducing prescription drug costs. And it reflects the President's commitment to reject any benefit cuts to Social Security, extend solvency by asking the highest income Americans to pay their fair share, improve financial security for seniors and people with disabilities, and ensure that Americans can access the benefits they earn. And in what will be a decisive decade for America and the world, this budget reflects the national security strategy by including robust investments in military readiness, our diplomatic and developmental t development tools, and honors the sacred commitment to our veterans. The budget achieves all of this while building on the President's proven record of fiscal responsibility and honoring the President's promise that no one earning less than 400000 per year will pay a penny more in new taxes. His budget reduces the deficit by roughly $3 trillion over the next 10 years, on top of paying for new investments by cracking down on fraud, wasteful spending, uh, and abuse, including by reducing prescription drug costs and making the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Boyle. Uh, and thank you all for the opportunity to appear here today. Thank you, Director Young. We'll now move to the question and answer portion of the hearing. I yield myself five minutes. Um, you mentioned the, that the president's uh, policies have lowered the debt by about a trillion dollars. Let, let, let's be clear here. The president was in hiding for about 100 days. Chuck Schumer swore he'd never negotiate a debt ceiling. We had colleagues on this committee saying, it's reckless, we should never do it. And they were uh, sort of, the sky is falling. And because Republicans said, we cannot let, we cannot just have a clean debt ceiling where we don't consider the 34 trillion record debt for this country, the 20 trillion that'll be added, this unsustainable fiscal path. And so Republicans, and this is the truth, I can look you in the eyes and tell you, Republicans uh, led to bring Democrats to the negotiating table and we actually together reduce spending year over year. And over the 10 year window, about a trillion and a half or something close to that. Now, I, I appreciate that the president and the administration worked with us, but had Republicans not pushed back, 
Had we not led uh, ranking member, we wouldn't have that record. So I, I think the people need to understand that that's the kind of pushback and kind of political courage that Republicans and Democrats have to exercise if we're going to bring the debt down. Um, the, 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 I don't believe that the president is fiscally responsible, but not because he says he is or doesn't say he is in speeches. It's because the last three years, we've seen six plus trillion dollars in new debt added to the national debt. And because his budget that we're talking about today puts us on a path of the highest sustained spending taxes and debt in the history of the country. That's, that's a fact, too. There's nothing fiscally responsible about that. Leaving an average debt of $1.6 trillion a year is not fiscally responsible. That's a deferred tax on our children. We're going to bankrupt the country. Again, there's no perfect plan, and Republicans hadn't had, they're, they're not a profile in courage on reducing spending like I think is the driver of our debt. But no, this is making things worse. This is gasoline on the fire that is consuming not only the money in the pocketbooks of our fellow Americans, but it's going to burn up any hope for a bright and prosperous future for our children. Now, you thought I had a question in here, didn't you? I'm going to have a question. My question is, um, if, if I asked you, and I don't want to trap you, I don't want to play gotcha, let me just, we had an FRA agreement, right, out of the debt ceiling, fiscal responsibility agreement. It was a spending cap deal. Well, I thought it was a pretty good deal, and I still think it, it, it's a good deal, but it's not nearly as good as I thought, and most members feel the same way. Because, and you're an expert, eighth-degree black belt in appropriations jujitsu, we had a bunch of side deals that were off balance sheet spending. The American people have no clue, no clue, Director Young, about what is budget authority and what is uh, outlays. What we do is we stuff the turkey of emergency spending. We stuff the turkey of other gimmicks like chimps and rescissions. And the American people never see. And then we go out and do press conferences and press releases that say, we got a top line of $1.59 trillion. We reduce spending. Does that bother you? Because I think if the American people deployed the same budget gimmicks, accounting fraud, they would go to prison, literally. I think it's criminal. And by the way, Republicans do it every bit as much as Democrats. Do you agree with that? Can you opine on that? Will you work with me to clean that up at a minimum? I mean, whether the spending is more or less or the same, can we all agree we can't hide the ball from the American people and that this is accounting fraud? I yield. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, you won't be surprised to hear my response. I think you'd see two different press releases that came out of that budget deal. I think Democrats were very happy to point out uh, that we were going to be able to maintain spending for child care and NIH and all the other things and, and produce a, what we call non-defense discretionary uh, in, a, in a flat scenario. We were very honest about that. That was necessary to see 76% of Democrats in the House vote for that package. So Why didn't uh, we put it in the budget authority? Why did we have to stick it, uh, a non-emergency items in emergency? Why do we have to put uh, chimps and suggest that we're reducing spending when we're actually adding more to spending? It's fair enough for you to say, we committed to spending more. We think that's a good thing. But it's not the 159. This is money in addition to it. Can't, shouldn't we at least just deal with the numbers that the American people can understand so they know what their government leaders are doing and what they're paying for their government? That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that you were arguing for more spending. We were arguing for less. There's no question about that. More bureaucracy, more government, less government, less bureaucracy. It grew 40%. The government did, the people's government since COVID. We thought we ought to right size the bureaucracy. Fair enough to debate that. But I'm talking about just transparency. Can yeah. we work together on making that a more transparent yeah, Mr. transaction? Mr. Chairman, what matters uh, to me, what matters to the president is what we're able to invest in these programs that help working families across the country. Whether it's in what you call CHIMPS, uh, which are changes in mandatory programs or emergency spending, what matters is how much goes to child care block grants, how much goes to Head Start. Uh, so, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, if there is uh, interest in doing that straight in budget authority, we're with you. 
Uh, but, you know, we were negotiating uh, in good faith with then Speaker McCarthy, uh, who had uh, his own outline of how he liked to see the numbers come in. Uh, and we, uh, as you point out, came to the table and worked out a deal. The bill you all see today and that uh, you're going to vote on on fiscal year 24 uh, complies with that deal, but I appreciate the complaints about it. But it is a show of bipartisanship that both parties were able to come together. We're six months late, uh, and uh, we certainly hope, and you'll hear from the president, that that bill is passed as soon as possible to prevent an uh, uh, avoidable shutdown. So you have my commitment uh, to, to work uh, if, if uh, the other side wants uh, this all in budget authority uh, or chimps. Doesn't matter to us. What matters is the investments we're able to make for the American people. I, I'll reserve my comments so that my ranking member and other colleagues can ask their questions. So, um, Ranking Member Boyle. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I cited the uh, the recent this week's uh, cover, of The Economist. It's not just The Economist. All of these uh, news outlets as well. I thought I'd read off a couple in terms of the performance of the economy under the Biden administration. Washington Post, U.S. economy's rising growth, falling inflation, quells recession fears. Bloomberg, U.S. is still world's biggest economy as it extends its lead over China. BBC, U.S. economy is powering ahead of Europe's. CNN, another shockingly good jobs report shows America's economy is booming. The Guardian, Biden right to say U.S. economy is world's strongest, Trump ally says. And I could go on and on about the record of this administration as it relates to economic strength. Let me turn, though, to uh, Social Security and Medicare. I talked about the Republican budget just released yesterday, the Republican Study Committee, which includes 80 percent of House Republicans, um, proposing trillions of cuts in Social Security and Medicare. That does seem aligned with what former President Trump said. Just last week on CNBC, former President Trump said, quote, there is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements, in terms of cutting, end quote. I'm wondering uh, if the president agrees, if President Biden agrees with former President Trump's view about a lot to do in terms of cutting entitlements or the House Republican budget, which cuts Social Security and Medicare. Do you agree with that approach and, and what approach does uh, President Biden's administration take in his new fiscal year budget? Well, Ranking Member Boyle, you heard it from the president himself at the State of the Union. Uh, he will not uh, sign any legislation, and we will do anything uh, to prevent benefit cuts uh, in these. And you heard me speak about this. These are not just programs to people who have paid into them their entire lives. Imagine having the rug pulled from under you, uh, thinking you were going to retire, thinking Social Security and Medicare are going to be there for you. Now, we think there should be plans uh, to make sure they're solvent. Uh, and in addition to no benefit cuts, we believe uh, the highest income earners in this country paying more into both of those programs uh, would create a solvency situation well, let me, without having to cut benefits. Yeah, let me interject there just to um, segue to what I think you're about to, to speak to. Uh, where there has been bipartisan agreement, a number of us, both the chair and me as ranking member, have acknowledged that with Social Security, the trust fund is projected to expire in 2034. In Medicare, the trust funds are set to go insolvent before that. So no, no one up here is saying that we can't do anything. I was wondering if, if you could address that and talk about um, the president's approach. Yeah, I talked about the, the principles he believes in in Social Security. Uh, one that doesn't get as much attention, in including no benefit cuts uh, and asking the wealthiest Americans to to pay more into Social Security, is we need to make sure Americans can access their Social Security benefits. Look at the Social Security Administration's budget. As beneficiaries grow, the number of staff and resources are on a complete opposite curve on the way down. We have asked for increases. Uh, speaking of non-defense discretionary, when we don't fund that, we don't fund things like Social Security Administration. Uh, so we implore you to please uh, pass uh, the Social Security Administration 9% increase the president's asking for. On Medicare solvency, uh, you, you've seen this proposal before uh, from the president that asked the wealthiest individuals to pay 1.2% more 
uh, into Medicare. Uh, as the chairman is right, also the prescription drug savings. If we expand the prescription drug uh, provisions, allowing Medicare to negotiate, that saves for seniors and also saves for the government. Um, we also close tax loopholes. Uh, those who find ways not to pay into Medicare ensure that they do. Those things would extend Medicare insolvency uh, in perpetuity. That's a big deal, and I hope we can take that proposal seriously uh, and, and get it debated. And I would uh, remind folks that the ability, for the first time ever, for uh, Medicare to negotiate down the cost of prescription drugs was thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, which every single Republican member of the House and Senate voted against. And with that, I thank the director and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for only using the five minutes. He continues to- Democratic uh, efficiency again, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I teed that up for you. Uh, Ralph Norman from the Palmetto State, five minutes. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Young, for appearing. Thank you for your call, too. You're always uh, uh, good about that. Um, you know, as, as our chairman mentioned, the president has been in hiding. Now, he did come out of hiding at the, I don't call it State of the Union, I call it State of the Screen, um, where he pretty much screened the whole time. He did read a teleprompter pretty well. But let me ask you this, how do you define pay your fair share? Define that for me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Norman. In our uh, suite of proposals on revenues, I can talk about a few of them. One, corporations before 2017 tax law paid 35%. We would ask that corporations go to 28%, so not even as far back as they were paying before the 2017 tax law. Uh, taking into, uh, capital gains but pay, as regularly order, ordinary income. But we are trying to get revenues back to, uh, when we talk about surpluses in 2000, 2001, uh, back to those historical averages that allowed for those, uh, the, the room to create surpluses. All right, let me ask you, if you ask everyday Americans, would they agree with a $4.7 billion Southwest border security fund that absorbs illegals, it doesn't stop it, it absorbs them into the country? Would the average American agree with $3.2 billion for advanced gender equity and equality worldwide, whatever that means, would they agree with 2.5 billion for the Centers of Disease Control to address the causes of violence in the communities? Define that for me. When he's letting everybody from 160 countries, including uh, gang members, come into America. Uh, 60 million uh, for gun violence research across the CDC and the National Institute of Health. Uh, when you're letting everybody come in that, uh, as has been seen, the crime in this country is skyrocketing, would Americans agree with that? Would Americans agree with 11 million at the uh, DOI to preserve stories of cultures and history across America? Somebody define that for me. I'd love to follow those checks and see where they're going to. My issue is the priorities, I think, if you ask everyday Americans, they would revolt against this. That's why his approval ratings are in the tank and they're going to even lower. Um, a question that I have that many people uh, that's buried somewhere, uh, either in the budget or the appropriations, in 2018, uh, there was a bill that put up to basically set up the, the GPS backup system, which is the security of America. 2018, up to this date, uh, CBO sc scored it as a revenue producer. Uh, it hasn't been enacted since 2018. And it may not be a fair question because you may not know it, but could I get an answer uh, on why this isn't a top priority? Who is stopping this uh, at the DOT or where, whoever's... Um, the OMB has undermined this, but this is a national security concern. Would you give that back to me in yeah. writing? Happy to, Congressman. We're happy to look into it. Um, you said not enacted yet. I assume it's enacted. You're trying to figure out uh, implementation. Implementation of the GPS system, which everybody listening to this and in this room uses, but it's a national security issue. Um, the, the fact that we are, as the chairman mentioned, we're $35 trillion in debt and, and rising. 
we can ignore the other agencies uh, if we want to, but they're running in the red too for Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Highway Trust Fund. It's unconscionable what this administration is doing to not solve the problem now, particularly as, as we've got a national threats that are being highlighted uh, by our own people in this administration's cabinet. The FBI director is saying the red lights are going, the blinking lights are going off. And I guess it's going to take, I don't know how many more fentanyl deaths we have to have that's, that's a direct result of this administration ignoring the immigration issue. I don't know how many more Lake and Rileys, which he did get the name out during the screaming union, but he didn't get it right. Uh, how many Kate uh, Siley deaths we have to have before we say enough is enough. And the money, the priorities have got to be redirected. I got 21 sec 20 seconds if you'd like to respond. Uh, I would. Look, the immigration, I've been in this town for 20 years, is a difficult issue as any that faces Congress or any president or administration. Did president Trump address it with the wall. And we had a chance to do something on a bipartisan basis no, no, in the Senate that would have helped stem flow uh, and allowed us to have an orderly border. 5,000 a day, you call that uh, stress? Uh, having a with the resources needed. That's not right. Thank you. I appreciate you coming. I thank the gentleman from South Carolina. Now yield five minutes to my friend Scott Peters from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess we reached the point where if you don't like the content of a speech, you just insult the person who gave it. Um, I've heard he's uh, too doesn't have the energy to be president. Then I've got heard he's got too much energy. Whatever. Uh, I think we're here to talk about budgets, and um, I'm sorry to hear that. But that's that's the common thing we get now. Um, President Biden's proposal for fiscal year 2025 would lower the cost of child care for families, make health care more accessible to all, and help realize our clean energy future while cutting the deficit by nearly $3 trillion. I don't agree with everything in it. Um, I, um, I think the $400,000 uh, tax uh, floor is probably unrealistic. I'm concerned about the the lack of appreciation for private investment in, in life sciences. We have the life sciences uh, leadership in our, in our country. We're about to spend $50 billion to bring back an industry and chips that we let go. Um, and I'm concerned about um, undervaluing the public-private partnership that, um, that life sciences is in this country. Um, but the president's budget outlines a vision for America that I share. And um, now we have to talk about appropriations to implement that. Um, just this week, Repu Republicans threatened to shut down ICE, CBP, and other Homeland Security agencies for their own political gain. Um, and the immigration system has been broken for far too long. And Democrats agreed we need more resources at the southern border. That's why President Biden proposed billions of dollars in new funding and led bipartisan negotiations with the Senate on a comprehensive border package. That would have proposed more than $20 billion for border security. We could have increased the number of Border Patrol agents and asylum officers. We could have deployed more scanners to prevent the flow of fentanyl through ports of entry. We could have streamlined the, the asylum process in a way that would have made adjudication faster and kept people out who didn't qualify, which is about 90% of folks. And the, the, the 5,000 um, 5, uh, uh, limit was the point at which you would, be, you would be required to shut the border, mandatory shutdown, right? So it's not like some, when, when people complain about hundreds of thousands of people coming across. 5,000 was a point at which you had to do a mandatory shutdown. And we had an, a bipartisan agreement on that. Apparently, uh, 22 to 25 Republican senators were willing to vote for it until Donald Trump came out and said he was against it because he wanted the problem for his campaign. Not to solve, he didn't want us to solve the problem. Independently elected people. And in the Senate, people with six-year terms, two-thirds of them aren't even up for re-election. Uh, the, the deal was supported by the National Border Patrol Council, uh, but they would rather campaign about the problem than, than actually do anything about it. And I think it's quite appalling. Um, Americans are tired of that political theater, uh, and uh, they want leaders who will make the choices needed to solve big problems. And I have proposed a very practical thing, which is bipartisan, to help a number of make hard decisions and um, hard decisions on taxes and spending through a bipartisan fiscal commission and everybody hates it. The, the AARP was here uh, when we did the hearing on it. Uh, I've heard from all the groups um, that they don't want, they don't want, they don't want to do anything with Social Security. Even as we, we watch 10 years from now, we're looking at across the board cuts. They say, don't touch Social Security. That's the wrong answer. And since then, Newt Gingrich, 
and Grover Norquist have come out hard against it because they're afraid it will raise taxes. Well, I think I must, we must be in the right place. I think we must be in the right place. Um, but, you know, we, the, the point is that the politics here are as real as the numbers, that you need votes from both sides of the aisle to get this thing under control. Uh, and um, I, I um, much prefer the values set out in the Biden administration's budget, but uh, this process is not working. And um, personal insults won't solve it, uh, by the way, either. Um, I just do want to thank you, um, Director, for the work you did uh, in this last um, budget, this last agreement that we'll vote on tomorrow on the South Bay International Wastewater Treatment Plan. It's a critical facility managed by the International Boundary Water Commission, um, and uh, it's a threat to not just our communities, but to our Navy SEALs who train in the water. I had wonderful colleagues from across the across the political spectrum helping with that. Um, we'll continue to work on that. We didn't get all the money we'll need, but we got all the money we needed to get started. And uh, I think that's great. Um, uh, Director, I, I would just wanna really thank you for your work. Um, I, I'm proud to be part of uh, a group of people on this Hill that are more concerned about getting things done and solving problems uh, than, um, than yelling at the other side. And um, I'll continue to work with you to do that. Again, sorry I don't have a question for you, but I do want to thank you. That's that okay. Much. And Congressman, I want to say that this budget also supports that, that critical project. We are sending SEALs somewhere else to train because the water is, uh, is so dangerous to swim in. Uh, but I'm hoping we can find a way to get this done before even the fiscal year 25 process. Well, bouncing from one friend from California to another, Tom McClintock, five minutes. Well, thank you. Madam Director, as I listen to you and my Democratic colleagues, I just wonder if you're ever going to learn that you cannot spin the economy. Uh, everybody knows in their own lives how they're doing, and, and if you try to spin them, you just end up looking foolish and, and out of touch. The fact is, the day that Donald Trump left office, gasoline cost $2.39 a gallon. Inflation was 1.4%. A 30-year mortgage cost 1.9%. The jobs you boast of bringing back are largely part-time jobs that are being taken largely by foreign immigrants and not Americans. By flooding the market with cheap, illegal labor, you're killing the wages of American working families. 18% uh, inflation since you took office. That means a retirement fund on Inauguration Day of $100,000 now only buys $82,000 of goods. That's the price of all of the free money uh, that you handed out. You've deliberately allowed more than six million illegal aliens into the country in the last three years. That's a population larger than the entire state of Missouri, which is sapping billions of dollars from public schools, public hospitals, public housing, law enforcement, homeless shelters, food banks. It's driving up housing prices, and it's suppressing working families' wages. And uh, the one thing I do agree with the ranking member on is the most important question that Americans are going to be asking of themselves is simply this, are you better off today than you were four years ago? So please don't sit here and, and try and gaslight us. You're not fooling anybody except yourself. Now, you produced a budget that, with nearly $5 trillion in, in new tax increases over the next 10 years. Now you divide that by the number of households in America, that's roughly $40,000 from the average earnings of every family in this country. Now I know you'll say, well, that, those are, those are, don't worry, those are mainly corporate taxes that we paid for by wealthy corporations. Families don't need to be concerned. But corporations don't pay corporate taxes. There are only three possible ways that a corporate tax can be paid. It's paid by employees through lower wages. It's paid by consumers through higher prices. And it's paid by investors through lower earnings. That's your 401k. I don't know of any other way a corporate tax can be paid. Do you? Uh, Mr. McClintock, corporations could stop doing as many buy but stock buybacks uh, and not pay their people less and not pass on costs to the American people. Well, that's not true. That, 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 that comes directly out of their earnings that they use to pay their uh, employees, the earnings that they use to keep prices down in a competitive market, and the earnings that they pay to investors, which are people's retirement funds. You know, you've already required taxpayers to pay off $132 billion in loans taken out by, by college students. 
How much more are you proposing in this budget? Mr. McClintock, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. What, what are the, what was the question? You, you, you've now required taxpayers to pay off $132 billion in loans from college students. How much more are you proposing? Mr. McClintock, the president has been unapologetic in saying that we need to do whatever we can to reduce the burden that student loans uh, have had okay. for, for, for students that, that, that's who clear, have That's clear, but I, I think he should be very apologetic years. in this respect. You take two young people. One takes out a loan to get a degree in, say, ethnic and gender studies. That gets them an, uh, a DEI <laughs> position at, say, the University of Michigan. Average uh, pay there is $96,000 for such a staff position. The other young person takes out a $100,000 loan to buy a truck. Uh, that brings an average of $48,000 for, for, for a trucker uh, in, in a year to bring all the things that, 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 that we need in life. How is it fair for the truck driver to be forced to pay for college graduate loans in addition to paying off his own loans? Uh, Mr. McClintock, there are also truck drivers who have taken on student loan debt, hoping for a brighter future, uh, and so, have so not are, gotten are the have, jobs that they've been are, are promised by Are you proposing the college student making $96,000 should help pay off the trucker's truck loan? I think you're using one example. There are many truckers who have student loans who have benefited from this president's policy. Here, here's the fine point of the matter. Uh, in, in a free society, every consumer votes every day with every dollar he spends on, on what the economy will produce. When government takes that dollar from him, it reduces by just so much, not only the choices he can make for his own family, it reduces by just so much the incentive he has to produce goods and services for others. That's why socialism produces misery and poverty wherever it's imposed on a society. Now, you've just proposed the highest peacetime government spending ever. That takes away the choice of individual consumers to meet their own needs and their own, uh, with their own earnings, and it destroys the incentives of individual producers to meet consumer needs that in turn destroys the prosperity that we once took for granted. Nothing good will come of this. And if you can't understand that, it is time that you be replaced by those who do. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from California, and now yield five minutes to Ms. Barbara Lee from California. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Director Young. Thank you so much for your leadership and for um, a budget that, yes, it does uh, reflect, I think, uh, the values um, of our country. But also, let me just say, uh, I also believe that a budget is a moral document. And uh, Director Young, I think it's fundamentally wrong to um, allow the size of the defense budget to increase, even though uh, the Pentagon recently failed, I believe it was six, its sixth audit uh, in a row. Uh, and the president's budget requests now 184.5 billion more for defense than non-defense programs. And so I guess um, just speaking about the, the morality of this, uh, how in the world do we allow this to happen? Uh, and why should we have confidence that the Pentagon will spend taxpayer dollars responsibly when they can't even pass an audit, uh, rather six audits? And then secondly, um, where could we spend and how could we spend the $184.5 billion to support programs that would protect the middle class and keep people uh, out of poverty? And um, I know that there are programs that are consistently underfunded because of defense spending increases. And so I don't understand how the department can make a, this kind of a commitment when they can't even pass not just one clean audit, but six audits. How, how do we allow that to happen, Director Young? And um, I mean, we penalize taxpayers for scamming the system and for cheating on their taxes. Uh, something is fundamentally um, wrong. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Look, this, the budget we put forth for non-defense and defense comply with the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Um, many of the members uh, here support it. Uh, this president, uh, from day one, has been committed to upholding our nation's sacred obligation uh, to, to protect and equip and prepare our service members. Uh, I appreciate the concerns on, on audits. Uh, I share those and defense and all of our agencies we expect to be uh, good stewards, but we believe that this budget is uh, not only complies with the FRA deal, um, but also um, uh, meets the needs of our troops. Uh, we're in a uh, complicated world, uh, as you see, but we also believe in diplomacy. I know uh, the subcommittee that you're ranking member on, and we believe we put a balanced approach between 
uh, our, our, our military and our diplomatic presence in the, in the budget we put forward. Okay, directing, that's fine, but I still wanna know how an agency, a department can get away with failing six audits and still get an increase in their budget. I, and believe you me, uh, when I talk about um, defense spending, I'm talking about, and I know where a lot of the waste, fraud, and abuse is, is with the weapons and arms dealers. Uh, it's not with our troops, and I fully support making sure that our troops are taken care of, that we're ready, our readiness is where it should be, but I, for the life of me, can't understand why taxpayers spend hard-earned dollars uh, now added or added um, or ask for an increase when the defense budget continues to get um, scammed. Uh, failing six audits, it's unacceptable. That why is unacceptable. Uh, but as you pointed out, and I pointed out. Uh, the mission of the department means that we have to put forward a budget that is uh, aligned with our national security strategy, which means we have to provide the funds to update our equipment uh, and provide for our service members. A lot of this budget is also a pay increase uh, for military personnel, uh, and we have to be, m remain prepared and on a footing uh, given the complexities around the world. I understand that. Okay, so how is the Pentagon penalized? What what triggers if you fail six audits? How do you how do you um, recoup that uh, invest those investments, taxpayer dollars, and then how what penalties? I, I mean, ordinary folks get penalized for uh, wrongdoing, for uh, not not living by the rules. Uh, Part of the Pentagon's issue on audits, uh, and I want to make clear, fa failing an audit from this standpoint does not mean the Pentagon doesn't know where most of their money is being spent. Uh, one, they need to get their real estate uh, and knowledge of what they own and how to cost that out. That is a big driver to their audit situation. We are committed to working with them, uh, just as we work with other agencies who have uh, management and budget challenges, uh, and we've got to get this right. You're absolutely correct. But they flunked six audits, and uh, the president's asking for a $187 billion increase. You would think that until they got it right, we would uh, at least ensure that uh, all of our national security needs are met, but not give them an increase, because they're going to continue to flunk. They'll be flunking a seventh audit if, in fact, they're not penalized and they don't get this under control. And I think the taxpayer deserves to know why in the world aren't they being penalized if they're flunking audits think, rather than getting an increase? Is some, something's fundamentally morally wrong with that. General Lady makes a good point. Uh, I, her time's expired. We're going to now go to Mr. Grothman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Thank you. That was a good point. Um, I, I, there are a lot of things in this budget I wonder about, but I'm going to start by, with the earned income tax credit. The GAO has found in the past that the EITC has an improper payment rate of 31.6%. Could you comment on that? And do you think when we have such a high improper payment rate, now would be the time to bring more people into this program? Uh, that program and that tax credit has helped uh, millions of working families across this country. We absolutely are concerned, and we report the improper payments uh, as, as a part of GAO's report. They get that from us, so we are transparent about the, the need to fix EITC. I would be remiss if I didn't see some of the similarities between the last two questions. Uh, we can and try to fix a program without taking away from those who need it most and working families with EITC. The, I, I've never been a fan of the EITC, and the more people I talk to in my district, you know, I'm, I'm struck by, say, a, a woman who runs a low-income housing project, and or employers who hire people who take advantage of the EITC. Um, and two, as far as uh, employers, they see as the earned income tax credit is phased out, people don't want to work more, right? I think the EITC, depending upon the family size, somewhere between sixteen and $20,000, it kind of discourages work, right? Because they, they begin to take it away. Um, and of course, you're discouraging work by taking away the EATC 
at the same time you're taking away a low income housing and SNAP and everything else. Are you aware of the fact that these programs discourage work and that employers, particularly when you're employing people in that $10 to $15 an hour range, it's common for them to recite, recite stories of either employees who don't want to work more or don't want raises because it'll take away their government benefits. Mr. Rothman, you and I had a similar exchange last year. I think with EITC and child tax credit, we have not seen data that supports that. We've actually seen the opposite on the uh, research I've seen on child tax credit, for example. Uh, families who have enough income maybe to put their kids in child care, uh, women, uh, and some men are able to actually re-enter the workforce. So we've not seen that data. I don't know to ask you last year, but... CTC, but similar yeah. in similar vein. Does it discourage work? Right. Um, they also, obviously, as with many programs like this, uh, and it's true the Pell Grants, by the way, which you're increasing as well. Let's focus on the Pell Grants. Um, I have heard uh, complaints among constituents that their children don't get Pell Grants, or maybe complaints that their siblings' children get Pell Grants, um, who don't work as much. Uh, usually if you get married, it makes you ineligible for them because it moves you up the percent of poverty you're under. Do you ever hear complaints of people saying, I'm middle class, my child has to take out the student loans, uh, my sister's not working, her child gets, quote, free college? Are you, are you aware of that perverse incentive in there? Um, you, you brought up something you've heard from your constituents. I've not heard that complaint about Pell Grants before. Typically, Pell Grants have enjoyed uh, wide range support because they do help working families, um, not people who sit at home, but working families. Uh, send their kids to school when they couldn't afford it any other way, which is why we have been committed to doubling uh, the size of Pell Grants. And it doesn't bother you that those Pell Grants, if you're middle class, you're not eligible. But if, if you're not working or work very little, you're, you're getting an even more generous grant. Um, like I think we have a larger issue of college affordability we have to do something about. You're absolutely right, cost of debt. Uh, even people with Pell Grants often have to take on debt. Uh, so you're hitting on issues uh, that we have to find solutions to, but one of the key ways to help working families is through the Pell Grant program. I'll give you one more thing. Uh, you're, you're expanding SNAP as well. When I tour my food banks, I, I like to tour them, and it's wonderful to see uh, so many people helping out people in need. But when I tour the, uh, the food banks in my district, they always make a point that all the food there is what I'll call healthy food. You know, when I go to a food bank, privately operated, operated by a church, what have you, you never see Mountain Dew or Pop-Tarts on the shelf. It's always better stuff. Would you consider, if you're going to expand SNAP, restricting it more um, to programs uh, um, like, like we have for uh, um, uh, the WIC, uh, where we no longer give unhealthy food, particularly at a time we have a obesity uh, epidemic, we have a problem with diabetes among young people. Do you think they ought to change that that SNAP program to make it more like the WIC? Congressman, I'm happy. The gentleman's to, time's expired, but I, I would yeah, like for you I'm to go I'm happy to talk to question. the Secretary of Agriculture and Agriculture about the nutritional uh, requirements in SNAP, and I want to thank everyone here for also their support in, in WIC, and uh, thank you for bringing up that critically important program. But I will take that back to agriculture, uh, this idea of uh, nutritional guidelines. I thank the gentleman from Wisconsin, and now yield to the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes. Well, it is, it is such a pleasure to uh, see you here today. Thank you so much. Um, for what you have done. And I really think that this budget reflects what the president and actually really what the, the Democrats in Congress have wanted to see for everyday Americans um, and to ask the wealthiest people to pay more, which I think is absolutely fair. So um, I just, I, I wanted to, to just uh, ask you um, what would actually be the effect 
of asking a small amount of people to, uh, to, to pay an additional 25% um, um, in, uh, in, in, in taxes, um, which I know, uh, and you can correct me if wrong, would raise about $500 billion for our economy over the, the next uh, decade. Uh, but I'm wondering um, if you could tell us, uh, uh, Director Young, um, um, if, if you could give an estimate of how many people would actually be subjected to this uh, to this larger tax, and what is their average net uh, worth? I think you're talking about the tax proposal uh, that we call the billionaire tax. It's also yes. hundreds of millionaire tax. Uh, it affects the wealthiest 0.01 percent of taxpayers. Uh, it hits the top one percent billionaires and hundreds of millionaires. It raises 500. A billion dollars, uh, even though this is a small population. So that speaks to the wealth in this population. That speaks to uh, the ability for them to use the tax system in ways that are not available to working families, uh, most of whom work, get a paycheck, get taxed a certain rate, uh, and have no idea of the, and cannot avail themselves of the same loopholes that uh, this top 1% uh, can. So we think it's common sense. Uh, OMB and our CEA at the White House have a report that says some of these uh, hundreds of millionaires and billionaires, the 400 billionaires, uh, the richest Americans, paid a tax rate of just 8% from 2010 to 2018. And that compares to what the average American might pay. That's right. Uh, to what? They should not get to pay uh, over 10% less than nurses, firefighters, teachers, uh, and people who go to work every day uh, and get taxed on their on their work. Well, I certainly think most Americans think that, but most Americans also think that what is in this budget is really going to help them, and isn't that what we're really supposed to be about? Um, we know that the um, permanence of the child tax credit, which we saw in the one year at work, that it reduced child poverty by almost by almost half. Um, that uh, we're going to have um, universal preschool, which would be um, so fantastic, a doubling of the um, uh, Pell Grant, which would help so many people that would go to, go to college. Um, we're going to see a lowering of the cost of health care for most Americans. This budget, answers the needs of most Americans. And I am so much in favor of it. And I think if we, regardless of party, ask people if these are the things that you want to see the federal government do for you, then this is it in the budget that has been presented. I'm just wondering if there's anything else you wanted to add. Look, as a, a parent of a two and a half year old who we thankfully live in a place with uh, near universal pre-K three or four. Uh, the path that is highly researched, it sets a child on, all Americans should have access to that. Uh, it what is about a, it, child and family leave too? Um, I mean, uh, the, the family leave. I mean, it's just common sense. One shouldn't have to choose, think about hourly workers. Uh, Jobs threaten if they take time off. You shouldn't have to choose between being there for your family, uh, whether that be due to an illness, due to a, a child being born, and worry about losing your job. Um, so it, it is about uh, how we view ourselves as Americans and what should be available to people and what is uh, treated as a right for people. It is also investments in what we believe create economic growth. Um, this isn't just about uh, spending in taxes. We want to also invest in programs uh, that will allow the economy to stretch, bring more people into the workforce. We believe childcare, uh, pre-K, paid leave will help do that. So no downside. We help the economy and we help the American people. Thank you, and Thank I you. yield back. Thank the gentlelady from Illinois. Now yield to my friend for five minutes from the Keystone State. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to take up Mr. Smucker's five minutes, yeah. but I do want to say you all aren't making me cry. I'm having 
a lot of allergy problems. So feel free to have that, and Mr. Smucker, I promise you. <laughs> Yeah, wait till this five minutes. Mr. Smucker, please, <laughs> please be gentle with the director here. I think there are tears of joy over the reverse the curse Absolutely. balance budget of ours. Okay. Well, well good morning, director. Good, good, good to see you. Uh, you're familiar, I would expect, with the uh, financial report that is produced by the Treasury on an annual basis. Uh, I am. And, and you've read the 2023 report? I've seen highlights of the 2023 report. W what would you say is the what, what the outcomes over the next 75 years? Um, it depends on if it is a baseline, which is baseline-based, not assuming the president's budget is uh, but, enacted, is going to show something similar to our baseline budget. Well, let me uh, show debt let, will. I'm sorry. That debt will increase. Yeah. Um, if we don't do things like the president has let, presented let me, in his budget. Okay, we'll get to that. Let me show you this chart from that report showing a uh, debt to GDP over the next 75 years. This is a long-term outlook, showing that uh, debt to GDP will go from its current level of 97% to about 500% in the next 75 years. And in the report, uh, the Treasury, your administration, uh, says, and you can put that away now, but um, if, if changes in fiscal policy are not so, I'm sorry, the, the, it says that, First of all, the projections in the report show that current policy is not sustainable, says that multiple times. I think that's the underlying conclusion to be drawn from that. Absolutely not sustainable. And then it talks about the urgency of fixing, of addressing it sooner rather than later, says if changes are not so abrupt as to slow economic growth and those policy changes are adopted earlier, then the required changes will be smaller to return the government to a sustainable fiscal path. Couldn't agree more with uh, with what they're saying here. Uh, what are the drivers of that increase in debt? What programs? So, uh, Mr. Smarker, you know the majority of government outlays are in what we call entitlement programs. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Yeah. Uh, you say, you said earlier that your uh, budget would create solvency for Social Security without needing to cut benefits. Uh, that is not true. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, a report from the Tax Foundation showing that if we indeed did what the Biden administration is recommending, raising uh, uh, taxes for those over 400,000 as outlined in this budget, it would, um, it would um, raise about three trillion over a decade. Uh, the shortfall in Social Security and Medicare. Without objection, so oh, th Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The shortfall over a 30-year period in these programs, as outlined in, in this report from your administration, shows that that shortfall is about $78 trillion. Raising revenue does not come close to fixing the problem long term. Do you agree with that? Uh, Mr. Smucker, I think you are using uh, the cost over a longer period yeah, but it's and 78 the, trillion compared to 3 trillion in revenue. Yeah, over revenue. a different time frame. Yeah, 10, 10 over three times, but 78 trillion is far more than three times. It will not. The facts are what they are. Raising revenue will not be able to fix the problem. It's why I agree with Scott Peterson, uh, Peterson that we need to have a real conversation with the American people about how we fix this going forward. It will not work. It's not sustainable. You can't tax your way out of this. It's impossible. The numbers are what they are. Uh, and that's why I believe a fiscal commission is so critical, so that we can come together, administration, members of Congress, bipartisan, bicameral, and have a real discussion. I think the American people are willing to make sacrifices. They're willing to step up when they understand that we have to do it or the alternative is, is really badly. So I was disappointed that the fiscal commission was not included in the latest uh, package, and I was disappointed that the uh, Biden administration does not support it. And I'd like to hear from you why that may be and whether there would ever be a time when the Biden administration would support this kind of discussion that we need to have. Uh, Mr. Smucker, probably for different reasons. The Biden administration has issues. Uh, the Republican leadership also have shown issues with a fiscal commission of the nature that came out of the committee, probably for different reasons than we do. Our concern lies exactly your line of questioning. Uh, the one thing on the table would be benefit cuts, not some of the tax proposals that we've talked to here, not asking high-income owners, 
It would be born on the backs of those who paid into the system and rely on this program to retire in peace. Uh, but, but your administration, your administration produced a report that says this is not sustainable over a long period of time. We do believe that taxing high income earners would add to the solvency. It, uh, it does not make it solvent, not true. I, I hope we can continue to have the discussion and I hope we can get uh, to the point where uh, you know, the American people have a better understanding of the situation that we're in. What you're saying today does not add to that. And I think, you know, I hope that we can get to a point where we can have a real conversation about this. And I think, again, a fiscal commission would be a, a, a really great way to do that. Thank you. I thank, thank the you. gentleman for his leadership on the bipartisan path mechanism and uh, for addressing the solvency in the long-term unfunded liability. I'm only speaking because you mentioned the leadership, the Republican leadership. Our speaker supports this. Um, it, it was a priority coming into the speakership as a new speaker, and we marked it up and got a bipartisan outcome uh, that said everything's on the table. And so there's plenty of criticism on both sides, as Scott Peters said. He said they got folks saying it's a backdoor way to cut Social Security, and some people say it's a backdoor way to raise taxes. I generally think when you got criticisms being lobbed in from both sides, you're probably probably in the sweet spot for actually doing something meaningful. Mr. Smucker has encouraged through this process all along the way that the White House and the administration be at the table, even when many people said that's a liability. It's just one more re way to kill it. And I just uh, would encourage you to take that back and, and, and think long and hard about a way that we can really work together to solve the biggest problems, one of the biggest problems for our country. Ms. Wexton, I yield five minutes to the gentlelady from Virginia. Yes, I'm going to come back to the gentle lady from Virginia, from Virginia, and. Um, let her gather her notes, and I'm going to yield to the gentleman from, who should I pick on? <laughs> oh, we'll let, we'll let the Hoosier State champion over here, Rudy Yockum, with five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Young, is the southern border secure? Uh, we absolutely need more resources and authorities. And let me just show you a chart of southern border crossings to the first 37 months of the last six presidential terms. Can you tell me which one of these lines represents the Biden administration? Uh, you, you picked me on a bad eye day, but even if it wasn't, uh, I tend not to guess in these uh, situations, so I'm sure you'll tell me. Well, it would, would clearly be the top line showing the highest number of border crossings in the first 37 or 38 months of this administration for the last six presidential terms. You know, the, you talk about needing more resources. The House Republicans, the very second bill that we passed was HR2, and the Senate has done absolutely nothing about that. The, this border, southern border crisis, is a crisis of President Biden's own making. He created this crisis with a stroke of the pen. He can fix it with a stroke of the pen. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to submit a record, into the record, a list of 64 executive actions that have been taken by the Biden administration to create this border crisis, all of which they refuse to take to overturn their own executive actions, which would fix the southern border. Instead of, instead of acknowledging the crisis at the border, the playbook has been to cast blame on others and downplay it. It's the same book, playbook that we've seen with inflation when we were told it would only be temporary or transitory. But Americans still feel the pain inflicted by Bidenomics wherever they turn. 
Director Young, I've got another chart to show you. Similar to the last chart, this one is the cumulative inflation for all items through the first 38 months of the last six presidential terms. Can you tell me which one of those lines would you believe would be the Biden administration's inflation? Again, Mr. Yakum, I'm sure you'll tell me. Do you have a guess? I don't guess. You don't guess? Not usually. Well, it would be no surprise to anyone in the audience or anyone listening at home that the top line showing the highest inflation for the last six first presidential terms is indeed the Biden administration. I think it's fair to contrast that with House Republican budget framework, which proposes no new taxes and actually balances the budget over the course of the next 10 years. Um, Director Young, do, what will adding an additional $18.2 trillion to the national debt, a 50% increase over where we are today in terms of national debt, what do you believe that will do to inflation, which again is your budget proposal, the president's budget proposal? Mr. Yakim, I would ask you to please look at our budget proposals. That's why we are asking the top 1% to not only pay for things like childcare and paid leave, but also reduce our deficit by $3.2 trillion and stabilize debt. How do you get to the $3.2 trillion dollar reduction? Where, where does that I number I think you're come? asking me to comment on baseline. We're here to talk about the president's budget and his policies and how they put us on a better fiscal path. So the, the CBO said prior to the Fiscal Responsibility Act last year that we were going to add an additional $20.3 trillion to the debt by 2033. They revised that after the Republican-led FRA down to $18.9 trillion, but yet your budget still calls for an additional $18.2 trillion of debt, and that is with $5 trillion of tax increases. So I'm a little bit confused on how the Biden administration is saying that they saved $3 trillion when on the current baseline, as you say, it is $18.9 trillion, but again, you're proposing $18.2 trillion of additional debt on top of $5 trillion of tax increases. As someone who helped negotiate the FRA, which I've heard a lot of indications we were dragged to the table and didn't see their child for a very long time doing that, uh, this president uh, supported where we ended up. We never believed the debt ceiling should be used as a political tool which would have jeopardized 8 million jobs, but we did this deal, we signed this deal, and this president uh, worked in a bipartisan way and Democrats voted for it in a bipartisan way to save a trillion dollars over the next decade. D Director Young, Yesterday, the president said, and I quote, wages are up more than prices. Inflation is down dramatically. Is that true? That is true. Inflation has moderated two thirds. So I have another chart to show you. And this is the first 37 months of the uh, president's term. One of those is inflation and the other one is real wage growth. Which one do you think would be inflation? You ever thought about labeling these lines? Uh, well, this again, is, I'm sure you'll tell us. Well, again, it is the highest, as the top line on there is inflation. Inflation continues to grow at a pace that is faster than, uh, is faster than real wage growth. So these numbers are pulled from your own federal agencies, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Who's right and who's wrong here? The President of the United States or his agency, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics? Mr. Yakim, if you're worried about lowering costs for the American people, which we are, uh, we give you a lot of proposals here that help families with child care costs, that help families with health care costs, that help families with energy but costs. The president's own words are in conflict with his own agency. So all I want to know is who's right here, the president of the United States or the federal agency that reports I'll to let the gentlelady answer the question. I don't want to give the president the credit, but inflation has come down two-thirds. There's more work to do, and that's why we have the proposals in the budget. I, I thank, thank the you. gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Indiana. Uh, as I yield uh, five minutes to Ms. Uh, Wexton, my colleague and friend from Virginia, let me say she's, she's battling a health condition. We all know that. And uh, there are some limitations, mm -hmm. but she is fighting through that. And uh, I'm inspired by her. There are people that make uh, committee meetings. They don't make committee meetings. We, we're all busy people. She shows up. She shows up every time we have uh, committee hearings. And uh, she represents her people. And... Uh, Man, God bless her, uh, and the people she's representing are getting a, a, a hell of a deal uh, with, with her. And uh, so, thank you. Uh, Ms. Wexton, the floor is yours. I yield thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, as some of you may know, last year I was diagnosed with progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, a kind of Parkinson's on steroids, which impacts my ability to speak. I use an assistive application so you can easily understand me. I want to thank Chair Arrington, Ranking Member Boyle, 
and all the members of the committee for allowing me to do so today. Director Young, it's good to see you again. Thank you for being with us today. As you know, investments in child care and pre-kindergarten education are critically important to grow our economy, bolster kids' development, and ensure that families have the support they need to thrive. It is estimated that the U.S. economy loses $122 billion a year due to child care challenges. Reliable child care helps parents re-enter or stay in the workforce, which can generate an additional $94,000 in lifetime earnings for mothers. We must bring down the costs of child care, which in my district costs many families more than public college tuition, and ensure our kids are set up for lifelong success. I have been proud to advocate for policies to bring down the price of child care and address the severe early childhood educator shortage in the United States, including securing funding for a program in my district to expand the number of early childhood educators. I was glad to see the major child care and pre-kindergarten investments President Biden proposed in the budget, including creating a historic program to guarantee child care for millions of low- and middle-income families. I have a three-part question for you about President Biden's proposed plan. First, how will this program work? Second, what would the monthly cost of child care be for most families under the president's plan? And third, what impact do you expect this will have on women in the workforce and on the overall economy? Uh, thank you, and to echo the chairman, thank you for being an inspiration to me. On, I touched on preschool a little with uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky, uh, but we believe uh, in the Biden budget uh, reinforces that preschool uh, should be free and would be free for all families. Uh, and most families would pay no more than $10 a day for child care. Uh, as someone who relies on child care and on daycare every day, I wouldn't have this job. Um, if it wasn't for child care and the ability to take my child somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so we believe the research, I have personal experience that suggests uh, women would be able to re-enter the workforce at larger numbers uh, if we gave them uh, affordable quality uh, child care. And too many families have to leave their children in places uh, where frankly, they don't feel comfortable doing so, but they have a little other choice. Uh, second, you all already fund a program uh, that is helpful, uh, but we believe we need the full child care program. But this budget also keeps uh, the discretionary program, child care block grants. This budget uh, would add a billion dollars from 2023 level to that program and Head Start programs, both critical uh, for families uh, who need uh, health care uh, or child care slots uh, to make sure that they can work uh, and that their children are properly taken care of. Thank you. Finally, to make President Biden's plan work, we need to ensure that there are enough skilled child care workers with the knowledge of early childhood education and development. How would the president's plan work to expand and improve the pipeline of child care professionals? Uh, one, we talked about many times today, uh, doubling Pell Grants uh, would give people the ability to, to go to college, pursue a career uh, in teaching. Also, uh, we have a proposal that would make community college uh, free. Uh, and uh, those students who are given the opportunity to go to school uh, and do it in an affordable way and not taking on uh, enormous amounts of debt uh, would be free to cho choose education as a career path. Like uh, my grandmother, in, in, uh, it is a profession uh, disproportionately uh, chosen by women. Um, and we believe one of the ways to, to make sure People continue to choose that noble profession is to make sure a college is affordable and we have proposals to do that. I think the gentlelady, her time has expired again for her steadfast commitment to this committee, to her constituents in our great country. We are uh, just uh, all better off and, and well served. Uh, ben Klein, 
from uh, Virginia. Yield five minutes to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna uh, also echo your comments uh, about our friend, the gentlelady from Virginia. We, you are blessed, Mr. Chairman. You have four Virginians on this committee uh, and uh, two on each side. And, and so we bring with us a wealth of knowledge and, and the gentlelady and I work together at the state level and work together on appropriations and now work together on the budget committee. So uh, there are lots of areas where we can agree and seek the betterment uh, for the people of this country. So um, Director Young, thank you very much for being here and as a former appropriations uh, director, uh, um, wanna thank you for your service on that committee as well. Uh, as you know, our country is currently on the hook for $34.5 trillion in debt with interest payments rising in the ranks on the federal balance sheet to the second highest government expense. Uh, the budget proposal presented by the Biden administration with one last opportunity to change course before the American people are presented with the opportunity to make the decision for him. Instead, the president has decided to double down on the same unsustainable tax and spend policies that brought us to this point, proposing a plan that would further subject American families and producers to the so-called transitory inflationary pressures while increasing our national debt to $52.7 trillion, $52 trillion by 2034. With the past as prologue, we can look to the president's record over the past three years and see the bleak trajectory that Biden proposals would take our nation. Among the many troublesome policy proposals within this budget includes $4.9 trillion in new taxes on American families and producers. This would only serve to slow our economy and put increased price pressures on families, but it would also give the Keynesians more license to spend beyond their means. Perhaps one of the most incredulous tax proposals of the lot is this so-called minimum tax on assets and unrealized gains that would turn the IRS into a glorified property assessor. Uh, Director Young, I don't know of a single country that has this sort of a tax, do you? Uh, Mr. Klein, this tax, as you, you pointed out, would go after unrealized gains. Uh, I would point out that those gains, uh, often not treated like income, uh, can be taken to a bank, used as collateral, uh, and millions of dollars received as loans against it. So, uh, if, you, if it's good enough to use as that kind of collateral, shouldn't it be taxed like income? Okay, if such a tax were created, what would stop the government from expanding it in the future to apply to middle-class families in order to supplement its spending habits? Uh, this president, uh, the one asking for, as you know, has an ironclad commitment. He is not going to sign a bill uh, that taxes those uh, making under $400,000. And certainly, unrealized gains is only uh, applied to billionaires and hundreds of millionaires. Uh, certainly not middle class families, not even close to middle class families. So, there, so you're saying there isn't anything in, in your proposal that the would law. stop? The law, future. yeah. Our proposal stops at billionaires and hundreds of millionaires. Okay, well, let me pivot slightly. Do you think that those who are millionaires, according to their assets, should be able to collect SNAP benefits currently? Uh, Mr. Klein, I'm... On SNAP benefits, those who are eligible, um, as you know, we, as part of the debt deal, uh, painstakingly found ways to, to ensure that those who were eligible uh, and provided waivers uh, in common sense ways. Um, so we, we have sought reforms with Republicans uh, in ways that protected that program. But do you think uh, so it's, it's there, there for the those who need it most. But you I don't, don't, I'm not aware of millionaires who are, who are getting SNAP benefits. Well, there is something called the broad-based categorical loophole that, would result, that, that has resulted in over 5 million people uh, who, shouldn't, who don't pass the asset test but are collecting SNAP benefits today. Um, this is a big problem, and that's why I introduced legislation to close this loophole. And I would hope that I could get the administration's support on that, because millionaires should not be eligible or collecting SNAP benefits. Uh, and I think I heard agreement on that. Well, I said I'm not aware of anyone doing that, but I'm happy to look at that piece of legislation. Thank you. Uh, continuing on that theme, in August 2021, President Biden's uh, Department of Agriculture de defied congressional intent and conducted a reevaluation of the Thrifty Food Plan without cost constraints, leading to a 21% increase in SNAP benefits at the cost of $300 billion over 10 years. As a former probe staffer, uh, do you think the pres precedent it is justified in ignoring Congress and expanding these programs to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year without 
uh, in violation of the 96 Congressional Review Act, which requires government agencies to submit policy updates to Congress. Uh, Mr. Klein, we believe we are on strong legal footing that we had every authority to undertake the thrifty food plan. But that was a major policy change, and you ignored the CRA, correct? We have every legal ability to undertake that plan to provide hungry people with more resources. I will disagree and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Director Young. I thank uh, the gentleman from Virginia and yield to our friend from New York, Mr. Espia, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Young. As an appropriator, I am keenly aware of your great work on this side of Congress and uh, just admire your efforts and your commitment to our nation. Director Young, you've seen an effort here to weaponize immigration once again, as it happens every four years when we peddle some narrative to try to get votes and get reelected. And yet, this is the Budget Committee. Uh, but I, I, I'll share with you some statements that we may have forgotten, but I think that we will all remember. I believe in the idea of amnesty for those that have put down roots and live here. 1984, Ronald Reagan. We must bring undocumented workers already in the country out of the shadows, George W. Bush, and rather George Bush. And George W. Bush proposed and signed into law a guest worker program in his efforts to address immigration. So immigration is not a new thing. It's been dragging along for decades, and this House has failed in its duties to address comprehensive immigration reform. So to try to say that it is something that just happened now under the Biden administration is an effort to weaponize it politically. And they do that because they don't want to talk about daycare uh, and child care. They do that, Director Young, because the president's budget includes a significant funding level for child care, a new program which families, for families making under $200,000 a year, would guarantee affordable, high quality daycare. Daycare has become really expensive. In my district, it could be $700. Uh, it could be half or even at the levels of rent every month. So moms that want to get back to the workforce can't do it because it's so expensive. But yet, the president has addressed that in his budget. And the other side fails to want to engage in this discussion. They want to talk about immigration because they're weaponizing it once again, as they do every four years. And so I want to ask you, Director Young, um, how important is this initiative uh, that the president has included in his budget? Uh, funding child care for, for working families. If anyone has sent a child to child care um, in the last 10 years, I'm in the middle of it now. Uh, it is unaffordable. I, I don't have the words to uh, quite outdo unaffordable, but if I had, I would use that. Uh, and we have a proposal that says families, some families wouldn't pay more than $10 a day for affordable quality child care. Uh, in addition, on the Appropriations Committee, you serve and, and Mr. Klein uh, serve. There is a bipartisan program, the Child uh, Grant Block Program, uh, Head Start, uh, which I know uh, retains bipartisan support, would see a billion dollar increase. But to really affect uh, the affordability crisis, we have to do something like the President's uh, mandatory proposal so that families uh, are not burdened, frankly, uh, with childcare and, and left with decisions uh, where they have to leave their children in places uh, that are not of quality and that uh, they have they cannot enter the workforce uh, because of those uh, decisions. Another issue that they don't want to talk about and they want to weapon when they want to weaponize immigration, Director Young is uh, included in this budget and that's parity for Head Start staff and teachers. So important for Head Start the longest surviving program since the 60s. And it literally gives kids a head start. So talk to me about pay parity. How important is that? Well, we can't recruit the teachers we need for Head Start because of pay constraints. 
Uh, they're often not paid what a teacher could get um, going to a public kindergarten, and we want quality teachers who have the certifications and Head Start as we do in public school. Uh, so we need to ensure that we have the funding necessary uh, to recruit quality uh, certified teachers uh, to teach our kids, to give them a Head Start. But if we don't get funding to cover the salaries, we're gonna lose slots. Uh, so we have to make sure we fund this teacher proposal uh, as well as provide enough to keep the slots. Head Start's only covering about 650,000 kids now. It uh, used to be much higher than that. Uh, and I'm very worried that we, we uh, don't keep up uh, and we'll continue to lose slots in that very critical program in communities like the one I'm from. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman from New York. And now I yield to my friend from Virginia, Mr. Bob Good, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Young, for being back with us. You know, it's astonishing that the President's most recent projected proposed budget uh, actually increases over last year's record largest proposed budget ever. This new budget proposes some $4 trillion more in spending, some four, $5 trillion more in taxes on the American people. Now, last time you were with us, uh, you had a little trouble with this question. I assume that you won't have trouble today. The national debt is how much now? Uh, as you know, the national debt is about $34 trillion. How, how quickly are we acquiring another trillion now? Uh, if you, I, I don't believe we take on debt by average a day, but um, okay, if- so It's increasing by a trillion dollars every so, well, how, how, how often? Which, interest rates, as you know, no, 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 are how, not a trillion the debt dollars. They're going up. Eight, the debt is going up by a trillion dollars approximately how many days or weeks or months, what would you say? Well, you wear that. let me point out one of the, the cost drivers of hey, that's not, adding I'm, I'm to the debt. Reclaiming my time. I don't want to know about trillion dollars. Reclaiming my time. Thank you. Debt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do you know how quickly the, the, the debt is going up by a trillion dollars? I think we just. I, I just think that would be an important thing to know as the budget director. It's going up about, about every 100 days or so, another trillion is being added to the debt. Uh, with the, what will the debt per taxpayer be by the end of the president's projected 10-year budget? How much would the, an average citizen owe? Or how much per citizen would we owe in debt with the president's projection? Well, Mr. Good, you know we don't tax citizens for debt payments. And ask you about tax and citizens. So the president's projected budget is going to go from $35 trillion roughly to how much the debt is going to go by his projection. Now, this is without extra supplemental emergency or extra spending. By his projection in his proposed budget, how much is he proposing to take the national debt to over 10 years? From the 34, 35 trillion to how much in 10 years? Well, first, Mr. Good, you know debt is cumulative. No, I'm asking this for a no, I'm asking for a number. He Mr. put it in Mr. his Chairman, budget. Mr. Chairman, can we he put it Mr. In Chairman, budget. if he put it in parliamentary I, 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 inquiry, I, 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 is the witness the allowed to answer the question without constantly being the clock interrupted? Is still running. The, 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 we're gonna give you the time. We will we will uh, we will give you more time. He's asking a question. Director Young, answer his question to the best of your ability. If you don't know, say, I don't know, and then we'll keep going. So what's the question? Let me re-ask my question. At the end of the president's, it's in writing, proposed budget, our national debt in 10 years will be how much? I just want a dollar. I don't want an explanation, just a dollar. If you look on S1 in the budget. Hey, let me stop you again. Yep. yep. The only thing I want to hear is a dollar amount. Well, you're in 10 going to hear years. my answer. Okay. Which is S1 then I'm going to stop you and budget. reclaim my time. This is my time. It's $52 trillion. $52 trillion is what his proposed budget. I didn't make it up. It's his budget. It's, it's in, in writing budget, that it would go from $34 trillion to $52 trillion in 10 years. Now, what does that amount equate to per citizen? If we take the 300, at the, it's estimated, the Census Bureau says we'll have 350 million Americans. Uh, in 10 years, 350 million. So if you take the 52 trillion, divide by 350 million Americans, about how much per citizen is that? Mr. Good, that is a, a, a false It's a math narrative. question. It is a false narrative. No, no the question is build, if we take the, my reclaiming time my time, role, thank you, I didn't ask his time. That, reclaiming my time, if we take $52 trillion, we divide it by 350 million Americans, that comes out to how much? How much do we each owe? What Mr. is our Good, I'm share? I'm not playing into this narrative as if we Okay, let me answer everyone, the question uh, for you. It's $150,000 per citizen is what the president is projecting 
without any emergency supplemental extra spending to take our national debt. That's what he's projecting to do, which equates to about $400,000 per has household by his projection. Now, we have never had this level of debt in history. Uh, we have never had this level of debt to GDP since World War II, and I'm sure you're aware of that. How would the president propose we would respond to a major crisis, say World War III, uh, or some other, uh, the next virus situation or whatever, with this level of debt coming into it? Mr. How would Gitter, we respond to that? Are we not in a crisis situation now with what's going on in Ukraine? We are, what's going on in the Middle is, East? Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? A plan and, and to respond reclaiming to my both time, of thank those. you. Reclaiming my time, thank and, you. And the border. Reclaiming my time. This Mr. House Chairman, acting. I'm reclaiming my time. The gentleman reclaims his time. I don't time. have a question there now. It's interesting on the priorities of this administration that the first thing you proclaim as the crisis is what's going on in Ukraine. I would submit that the president has created a debt crisis, unprecedented in our history, and he, he proposes to make it worse over the next 10 years because he wants to increase the debt by $18 trillion by his own budget. He has created a border crisis, which is further exacerbated by this budget, by the way, which does nothing to address the border crisis that he has created. But yet, when you speak of crisis, you bring up Ukraine because the president wants to borrow, borrow or print, uh, what, some $60 billion and send it overseas to Ukraine. I think it's great that you are illustrating for the American people what this president's priorities are, both illustrated by his budget today and your inability to answer basic questions about the budget today and the impact upon the American people by the debt that he is willfully creating, and you go right to Ukraine. The gentleman has 30 more seconds. The border supplemental is the, good. The, 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 well, gentleman, does, the gentleman's going to get 30 more seconds, and I'm going to give the gentlelady, Director Young, time to respond, but you get 30 more seconds. Well, so does the president have an understanding what the impact is of his spending, his deficits, his growing debt on Biden inflation under which the American people are suffering? Suffering? Does he understand the impact, again, of his spending, his borrowing, his printing, his debt that's causing the Biden inflation under which American people are suffering? Does he understand that? And, and with Mr. that, the gentleman's time has expired, Mr. but you will have Thank as much you, time as you want to answer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I get why people don't want to give the president credit for 15 million jobs at it for unemployment being at a 50-year historic low under 4% for two years. I get that. Uh, I get the grandstanding. But if you want to do something about the border, which I've heard a lot about, there was a bill right in front of Congress to provide resources and authorities, more than anybody could ever dreamed of in any bipartisan, amnesty bill. Uh, bipartisan scenario. But we choose to come in rooms like this to talk about the budget uh, and blast the president who tried to do something about it and you are the not. budget director. Uh, you ought to be able to answer it. budget listen, questions. Listen, I've got the mic. The, the, the border has a cost. It's fair to bring it up. It's a significant cost, but the time's expired, and now Ms. Ballant has the floor for five minutes to talk about whatever she'd like to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Young, for being here. And, you know, we do truly appreciate your, your both your professionalism and your expertise. Um, you're... You're not new to the Hill, and, and we appreciate the, the time that you've given us today. I have a question. We just heard this back and forth uh, about the debt. It was kind of hard to tease out the parts because there was quite a bit of uh, talking over your answers. Um, my understanding is that uh, President Trump added $8.4 trillion to the debt, and I'm wondering if I have that correct. Uh you do, and the point I was trying to make is debt is cumulative yep. um, over administrations. And do you know, was that the largest increase in the debt in, in modern history? In modern history, yes. Thank you. Appreciate that direct answer. One of the things that I talk about a lot in this committee is housing, and not just because it's greatly impacting Vermonters. We have uh, the second highest rate per capita of homelessness um, in the nation, which is surprising to people because we are a rural state. But I also like to bring it up in this committee because it is something that cuts across party line. It doesn't matter what uh, congressional district you're representing, you're probably experience, experience a housing crisis. And it is a, a growing crisis in rural America. And so across the country, we, we have seen skyrocketing rates. We've seen predatory landlords, hedge funds buying up uh, half a million homes. I know for me, I think about housing as, as the, the basis of stability for families. And so it en enables children to thrive. It enables people to get better health care outcomes. Um, and 
I know that we can end homelessness through more humane, cost-effective solutions that ensure that everyone has access, not just to permanent housing, but also with supportive services. And I'm wondering if you could this morning tell us how does the president's budget advance those goals of ending homelessness through more permanent supportive housing so people stay housed? So when we talk about lowering costs, which I think I've heard agreement that we need solutions, yeah. the president's put forward a, many proposals on housing uh, and I'd like to talk about a few. One, a uh, new first-time home buyer and home seller tax credit of $10,000 over two years. Uh, that would improve affordability for middle-class first-time home buyers. It also unlocks starter home inventory uh, for first-time home buyers and helps middle-class families who are locked in because of rates. Right. Now, we know rates are going to come down over two years. This would be a two-year bridge. So those middle class families could move into larger homes if they need to for their families. It would also unlock uh, starter homes. This budget also provides a $10 billion in uh, funding for new first generation down payment assistance program. Uh, we believe that is critical. We know most Americans hold wealth through home ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, my family uh, being one of them is a way into the middle class to, to own a home. Uh, and also to address the critical shortage of affordable housing communities, the budget provides uh, $20 billion in funding for a new innovation fund for housing experience, which would be a competitive grant program for communities uh, that want uh, to expand housing supply. So these are, this is critical. Part of, um, you know, lowering costs, what families will tell you they're hurting over is housing costs. Yes. We need more housing supply and more affordable housing these proposals taken together would do that. And I think people really discount the impact that a program like down payment assistance can, can really have on helping people build up equity. I know that was true when I was in my state legislature. I remember being in a committee meeting with some uh, members of my committee saying, well, you know, does this really make a difference to, to offer a down payment assistance program? It was so successful in Vermont, we reauthorized it numerous times because the take-up rate was incredible. It gives people an opportunity to get into homes and, and build up that equity. I'm wondering, too, if you could just touch uh, a little bit on the housing supply issue. It is There's a critical need right now. How does the president's budget address the shortage in supply overall? Because it is locking up basically at every level of the housing market. Yeah, the $20 billion I spoke about, which would be competitive, if communities wanted to apply for those grants uh, and take on the zoning challenges and the many, many other local challenges that there, there are to affordable housing, uh, this would allow communities to take their own local approach. Uh, each, each has their own issues yeah. as to why they, they can't build enough housing, mm -hmm. uh, and that is why we would uh, have a competitive program so people could send in proposals that work for them uh, and work with our housing agencies uh, to, to develop things that are that fit for your communities. Well, I really appreciate it. I know I'm over time. I just want to say um, how important it is for me to know that uh, the president and the administration understands how housing impacts the entire economy. And this is a way for us to have solid footing for, for individuals, for families, for communities. And I just really appreciate the attention to this issue. Thank you, Director Young, I appreciate it. Ms. Ballant, uh, I lost control of the clock a long time ago, so we're, we're just, but uh, that's okay. We need to make our points, they're important. And uh, my friend, the general, highest ranking officer here in the house and classmate from Michigan, Jack Bergman, take it over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a Marine, I'm used to sometimes high-intensity situations. This is not one of them. But I'm, as I've listened here, uh, reminds me of a time about 40 years ago when I was probably five years into the private sector medical market, and I had the opportunity to work for a wonderful leader and boss who believed that all of life could be boiled down to analogies of two types, sports and family living. So let's talk about, you know, family living. Um, Ten years after he made that statement to me, so 30 years ago, I had a chance to realize when, while going through um, a tough part of our family life, I realized that I know when no communication is going on, 
because I was uh, sitting with my then soon to be ex-wife, um, figuring out how to end a long-term marriage that kids were involved. And I would suggest to you that the kids, when we think about what we've talked about here, I've been trying to put myself in the mind of, a, of a, my daughters at the time who were 16, what they would think of the conversation here. How would it apply to them? And I think there is probably not a person in this room that doesn't say that what we are trying to do here is for the betterment of our kids or our grandkids. So I would suggest to you, until in this case, we figure out a way to repair the relationship between the parents, which in this case is the executive branch and the legislative branch, and all that are within each, we are still going to go farther down the abyss to where we can't climb out. So uh, I, would, I would just suggest to all my colleagues that we stop with the rhetoric that doesn't add value to what we're leaving for our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and whatever future generations. So I think we can all do better. Um, first term, when the chairman mentioned that some of us who were freshmen eight years ago were on budget committee, there was a data point put in front of us. You can tax the wealthy 100%. It still doesn't come anywhere near to what we need to begin grabbing fiscal control of our country for the betterment of our people. So I, I would suggest we could probably stop with that. So let's get now, you know, I have, I have sucked up three minutes of oxygen here of my time, but you know, this cycle, we as the budget committee created task forces. I, I have the honor of leading the task force on improper payments. So I'd like to focus on that just for the remainder of my time. And so let me read something here. Despite improper payments totaling more than 236 billion, in FY 2023, which is up from 150 billion in 2017 alone, the, the president's budget does not propose a government-wide effort to, to be, begin to solve the issue. I'm not saying we're gonna completely solve it, but begin to take a deep look. So what specific actions is OMB taking to improve the accuracy and the efficiency of payment systems to reduce the rate of improper payments. Uh, as you, one, thank you for your remarks, uh, Congressman. Uh, I believe you and you tell me uh, what our children uh, would be left with, and we have an opinion on that as well. Uh, and a respectful dialogue is happy to fix these very complex problems uh, in the country. As you know, the UI program is one of the largest drivers improper payments, the thing that makes that difficult. These are state run, so you've seen one UI program. You've seen let's look at the UI federal program. level. Let's not, let's not yeah. talk about, but so let's I'm, talk I'm, about at the federal level. Yep. We got, uh, admittedly, some things are at the state level. Let's talk about what we can look at right here in our own backyard. So in our budget, we have significant new proposals. Our second year asking for them. We're seeing actually some traction in committees of jurisdiction to move on legislation. Uh, we have uh, a a uh, 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 proposal that would save about $2 billion by modernizing and protecting and strengthening the UI program. So I'm saying it is not, it, there is a federal responsibility. The difficulty is that each state runs a different one. But we okay. have a proposal to improve that system, which would save about $2 billion. We're, I, I know my, my time has passed, and I don't want to abuse the time but unless we look at, in one example, the fraud related to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is federal, we're missing an opportunity and we're getting farther behind. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Michigan and uh, Director Young. Uh, we passed the first bipartisan uh, process reform, budget process reform legislation in a decade out of this committee and then this week on the floor and Ms. Ilhan Omar, my colleague, served as the ranking member. And I gotta say, um, I heard this. better watch your back, man. She's, uh, she was good, it was efficient, 
And um, I appreciate her leadership and support. I, I fully support her promotion. Uh, <laughs> I think it'd be unanimous. <clears throat> uh, that's only because you've sat here for so long next to me. Uh, Ms. Omar, you have five minutes for the, for, uh, the gentle lady from Illinois. Th thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, and I, 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 I don't want to get in trouble, so I'll, I'll stay as the, as the vice ranking. Um, Director, it's really good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to talk a little bit about um, addressing the opioid crisis that we're seeing throughout the country, especially in my district. According to the CDC, the national overdose rate uh, topped over 100,000 deaths again in 2023. Federal spending on the crisis has surged with roughly 40% more dollars flowing to our states. States like Minnesota have recently been allocated hundreds of millions of dollars for opioid overdose prevention as well. While all of this funding has helped, there's still much more to be done. That's why it was very encouraging to see the president's budget request continue, continuing to prioritize vital investment in uh, some HASA. These programs promote mental health, uh, prevent, prevent substance misuse, and provide treatment and recovery support. Director Young, can you outline the new funding priorities in this proposal that could better support our states and community organizations in the front lines of this epidemic? I don't think there's anyone here would, who would disagree that um, we have to use every tool at our disposal to do something about the ep opioid epidemic in this country. Uh, this president has put forth robust budgets, uh, even, uh, even in a, a flat budget under the Fiscal Responsibility Act, this president is showing that it is his priority to do something about this epidemic. Congresswoman, $44.5 billion for the National Drug Control Program agencies, an almost $900 million increase uh, over continuing resolution level of funding. Uh, this budget prioritizes expanding evidence-based harm reduction, uh, expanding access to treatment for substance abuse use disorder, overdose prevention, uh, combating narcotics trafficking networks, countering illicit fentanyl at the border, and disrupting the international synthetic drug trade. Um, I know we got into a little back and forth about the border bill. I think one place that has always had bipartisan support was in uh, the president's border supplemental request, which to put more of the equipment, the NI equipment at the land ports of entry uh, to catch fentanyl, um, from coming into our southern border, and I hope we can find a way to work in a bipartisan way to do something about this. Thank, thank you so much. I hope so. I hope so too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the housing uh, shortage as well that many of our communities are experiencing. I'm glad that this budget proposal keeps pushing for pro-housing policies, especially at a time when the dream of home ownership seems increasingly unreachable. To address our housing shortage, we must build more affordable housing and more different types of housing. Uh, this idea is core, the, is the core of my Homes for All um, uh, Act, investing billions of dollars in development of permanent, affordable public and private housing units with a focus on mitigating residential displacement and segregation. Congress can and must lead uh, here since it has done before by delivering funds to our public housing authorities. The federal government once directly helped build so much housing. We renovated and repaired homes and provided subsidies to increase home ownership on a massive scale. It is time to repeal the Faircloth Amendment and get back to directly assisting our localities with developing and guaranteeing stable housing for all. Director Young, can you describe both the ongoing and proposed actions that the administration is prioritizing uh, to improve affordable housing stock? Again, inflation is moderated two thirds, um, but families are still struggling. Um, and one place is in housing, a lack of affordable housing. That's why this president, when we say lowering costs is a the theme of this budget, housing is centered to that. Um, helping first time homeowners, helping middle class families 
uh, with tax credits, uh, who might be locked in with low interest rates, who need a bigger house for you know, a surprise third child. They need to move up to a bigger house. Uh, and we need first-time homeowners to have access to more housing stock. This budget would do something about that to allow um, a two-year tax credit. Also, $20 billion in funding to have uh, localities, municipalities apply. And if they have a zone problem, use the funding to do something about that. Build affordable housing. We know every solution is different depending on where you live. Uh, and we look forward to working with those who want to take on those pieces of legislation. Uh, wonderful. I know a little bit about that surprise third child. <laughs> so I felt like that was directed at me. Um, it but wasn't, I, I, actually. <laughs> um, but I, I, I appreciate um, the, the concern and care uh, that, that is given uh, to increasing more affordable housing, both in ownership uh, and, and just in stock. Thank you so much. I thank the gentlelady from Minnesota and yield to my friend from Georgia, Drew Ferguson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Young, let me thank you in advance for your phone call and our conversation earlier in the week. I appreciate you very much reaching out and doing that. Um, first of all, I want to say, I, and I've been pretty vocal about this, I think a lot of what we're doing here is just talking about ideology and different different views on how you accomplish <clears throat> various things. And I hate to see us rely consistently and argue back and forth on congressional budget numbers off congressional budget office numbers that are consistently wrong. And we've had Director Swagel in here, and we, we conveniently use those numbers when they help us, and we dismiss them when they don't, and that is true of both sides. Um, so I, while I respect that you, that you have your opinions on how to solve some of the challenges that are facing America, um, you know, many of us on the other, on the other side um, see things differently. <clears throat> One thing that I want to address right off the bat, because I think it's really important, is this discussion on Social Security, okay? Um, we will have the um, new administrator in today to, to talk to into our subcommittee hearing today, and I'm the chairman of that, to discuss his budget. Um, look forward to that discussion. But let, let's be real about the rhetoric and the commentary around Social Security right now. We hear constantly from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and we have seen nothing but, but really harsh language from President Biden over, um, over, the, over Social Security. Constantly, okay? And <clears throat> first of all, I can tell you as chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee that there will be no cuts to those that are, you know, in Social Security benefits to those retirees or people near retirement. I've, I've said that consistently. And we've got to be intellectually honest about what we are doing and how we are talking about it. It is going to be a bipartisan, bipartisan solution. It will require adjustments to the program and that includes adjustments to revenue. I think we're realistic in that discussion. So I would just make this simple request that we, that we have an honest discussion. Let me, let me give you an example. You know, the president has really hammered us and hammered Republicans um, with, a false, with a false narrative that we want to cut Social Security. In this very budget, in this very budget, um, you're going to cut Social Security payroll tax receipts by $17 billion over the 10-year period. How do, you, how do you square that? I mean, we have, a, we have a solvency problem. We have a huge spending problem at, the, at Social Security Administration. And yet, when you look at this, this budget cuts $17 billion out of, out of receipts. Uh, Congressman, is an effort to take you up on your your creed and honesty and in, in budgeting, uh, that $17 billion is a pure interaction with the tax policies in the president's budget. It is not a cut, it is not a policy decision, it is an interaction with the president's revenue proposals. But at the end of the day, doesn't that, doesn't that move money away from recipients down the road? Well, it does not compare to the sheer amount of money that comes into the Social Security. Payroll taxes are, uh, around $15 trillion. We're talking about a small amount based on revenue proposals uh, interaction. Also, it also doesn't take into account the president's ask that we ask high income. All right, so in, in a roundabout way, you kind of you said yes, I'll take that as, 
you know, sometimes you hear, you, you know, you say what you want to say, I hear what I want to hear, but I think we all heard that, yes, it does take revenue away, even if it's, in your words, a smaller amount. The, look, as you know, your colleague from, from Treasury, Secretary Yellen, is over at the Senate right now, having, having her discussions with the Senate panel. And in that, she had an exchange with Senator Kennedy, and in that she said, Secretary, when Senator Kennedy was going down the road of saying, what's the number generated by people, by raising payroll taxes on people making over $400,000? And in essence, she said, the president doesn't have a plan, he has principles. And he wants to work with Congress to protect Social Security and, and, ex, and extend its solvency. Well, we haven't had the administration come to us and talk to us about a plan. So when we start, so when we get, when we, when the president makes a, a campaign issue out of Social Security, yet his own Treasury Secretary says he doesn't have a plan, this, this goes to the, to the problem that I'm talking about with Social Security, which is, Really tough words come out of his mouth, but he doesn't even have a plan, according to his own Treasury Secretary. So again, Mr. Chairman, I, I know we're out of time. Um, I just hope on an important issue like this that we put down the we put we put down the the political swords, we drop the rhetoric, we work in a bipartisan way to to get the system as clean and efficient as possible. And then, and then as we do that, let's find a way to protect this great program together. I, that I yield back. Thank you. I associate myself with the gentleman from Georgia in uh, eliminating these issues as a, a political fodder and, and, and coming together and doing something big and something great and something important, uh, which is a good step for our seniors and for our country, it's, which is a good segue to a gentleman who's been a leader on a bipartisan effort to address the solvency of those safety net issues, or programs rather, and <clears throat> the long-term viability uh, of our country's finances. With that, Jimmy Panetta from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Appreciate your introduction. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member uh, Boyle as well. Director Young, good to have you back and always good to see you. Uh, I thought I was special and that I had a phone call with you as well, which I appreciate until I heard my good friend from Georgia had one too. Uh, but that, that says a lot about uh, not just him, it says a lot about you, uh, the fact that you were willing to reach out to members and you understand how important member engagement is. So thank you very much uh, for your prioritizing uh, member interaction. I appreciate that as we always have based on my interaction with you. Um, Today, obviously, we want to talk about uh, the administration's budget priorities, uh, but also finalizing administration regulations. Uh, obviously, and I think it's probably a sentiment on both sides of the aisle, we wish we could be fully focused on fiscal year 2025 instead of dealing with fiscal year 2024, six months late. Uh, and all, I want to first, obviously, uh, say a word that probably only you uh, and maybe one other person in this room and myself will understand, and that's Pajaro. Uh, and thank you for uh, what you've done to help secure significant amounts of funding, and including a recent $38.5 million uh, for emergency repairs to the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project. I appreciate that. I also want to applaud the administration for making strong investments in something that's very, very important to my district, and that comes with uh, talk about affordable housing, especially when it comes to tax incentives and, yes, mental health. Uh, I want to note that uh, this budget increases the solvency also of Medicare Trust Fund indefinitely, and I believe that we must do the same thing for Social Security by putting forward concrete solutions. Uh, part of that is what I've seen in this committee, uh, in that uh, fiscal responsibility, thanks to the leadership of uh, the chairman uh, and ranking member, uh, that a fiscal responsibility is a priority. Now, uh, we, I, as you heard, and I firmly believe, and as most members of this committee support, the creation of a fiscal commission to draft a plan to get out our to get our fiscal house in order, and that hopefully it's one that Congress will take a vote on. Now I know there's been skepticism for about the fiscal commission. Trust me, I've heard it in my district. But if there are other ways to clear the political hurdles needed for deficit reduction, I'm well uh, open to hearing about them. But today, today I commend you on this budget, which I believe sets a good example for fiscal responsibility. 
Now, as I've said, in my district, housing is the top issue. And I was pleased to see the first-time homebuyer tax credits in the Green Book, which can help families afford the higher cost of homes in districts like mine. I've introduced legislation with Senators Whitehouse and Heinrich to create a $15,000 tax credit for eligible first-time homebuyers and making it available at the point of sale, which I think is an important aspect of that bill. Director, why is it important to have these types of credits in this budget to encourage home ownership? Uh, most people, as you know, while they may be able to afford a mortgage, uh, need help uh, with as anyone who's bought a house knows the, the, the expense needed up front. Uh, and these credits allow them dur during their tax season uh, to, to get a lot of that money uh, back if this was adopted. Uh, so it is a simple matter of we want more people to own homes. Uh, we need to provide this kind of credit, especially for first-time homeowners who, as we know, people who bought second, third homes get to use their uh, what they made on those homes to help them move into a larger home. First-time homeowners don't have that ability. Exactly. Thank you. Now, look, I've also introduced le legislation that obviously prioritizes uh, LIHTC, low-income housing tax credits. But I also want you to be aware of a piece of legislation that I pat that I introduced by, in a bipartisan, bicameral fashion called the Workforce Housing Tax Credit. Because you have many people in my district who make who actually work and can't make too much to afford low-income housing. And so we need the incentives for middle-income housing, and that's why we developed the Workforce Housing Tax Credit. I also want to mention the My More Homes on the Market Bill, which basically doubles the cap of the, uh, doubles the exemption for the capital gains uh, on home sales so we can put more homes on the market and incentivize people to sell their homes that want to protect their nest egg. I want to bring up something real quick. Um, yesterday I was speaking to a group who finances low-income housing, and they noted that HUD had proposed regulations to streamline permitting, but they need approval from the OMB. How can OMB play a part in streamlining and reducing HUD housing permitting requirements? Uh, I'm happy to look at that specific uh, rule if it's at OMB. As you know, uh, we often are a place where uh, agency uh, rules and, and guidance come in to make sure that they are uh, uh, one, that they have, other agencies have had a chance to look at them, and we have an interagency process, but I'm happy to look at uh, that particular uh, piece and make sure uh, that is on track. For Outstanding. Release. Outstanding. Thank you, thank Director. You. I thank the gentleman from California, and now yield five minutes to my friend from the great state of Texas, Chip Roy. Uh, thank the Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Young, for appearing before the committee uh, and for your service. Um, couple of questions. Uh, first question is, uh, with respect to revenue assumptions under the president's budget, um, I believe and have it that the, it assumes revenue will average 19.7% of GDP year over year over the course of the window. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I believe it goes up a little from that level at the end of the... Who's around, but, but I think it right. assumes 19.7% right. over the window. And one year in particular in 2031, it assumes 20% of GDP. Now my question, putting aside debates over tax policy and what it does or doesn't do to revenue, because right, we can have a debate on that, have a whole hearing on that. Would, true or false, though, that 20% of GDP revenue to the federal treasury has never actually been achieved? Right. In the 2001, 2000, it was close to right. It was close. It was like 19 point right, right? right? But, but we've right. never actually got 20%. And this budget does assume 20% in 2031. And 19.7%, I would, would the, the gentlelady agree that uh, we've only achieved something in that zip code three times in our history. Post-World War II, dot-com time, you roughly described around 2000, 2001. And then in 2022, uh, I think 2021, somewhere around there that we achieved 19.6-ish percent as a percentage of GDP as revenue coming to the Treasury. Would, would you agree roughly with that description? With, the, with those time frames you've laid out, yeah. Right. And so I guess my point is, notwithstanding that reality, that, that, that the budget the President has put forward and that you're here defending assumes revenue over the course of a 10-year window at 19.7%, which we've only achieved three times in history, at, at very at spikes, right? Spikes on the chart. If you hold a chart up, I've got one on my screen, but not to show you, but you've seen it. It spiked up three times at that level. 
And then we've got it going up to as high as 20%, which we've never achieved. So it begs the question of tax policy that could achieve such a thing, right? Because we've had tax rates as high as 90%. We've had corporate tax rates as high as 35% or 40% or whatever. We've had tax rates lower. We've had, market, right? It's been all over the, the entirety of that history from World War II to now. It's been all over the place. So we could debate that. But my question to you is this, is that notwithstanding that, those assumptions, that that's the revenue that would be needed to be brought in in order to achieve the objective of what you've got in the budget that still produces a rather large amount of deficit spending. That the truth is that with respect to interest, right, we will pass the amount of, the amount of interest spending passes defense spending this year. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, by a right. small amount, but yes. But, and then interest spending cracks a trillion dollars in 2026, right? Under the president's budget, a trillion uh, yes. dollars will crack in 2026. And that in every year of this proposed budget, interest spending is estimated to be greater than defense spending over the course of that entirety of that 10-year budget. Is that correct? Uh, it depends. You know this. It depends on where interest rates are. That they're great variable, but our estimates are sure uh, it will it will go up. Right. So every year in the budget, right? And the whole budget is an estimate. I mean, the whole budget is just you know. The further you get, the further you get out, right. the, the yeah. So so you're putting that in there. So my point is just, if you look at the total amount of deficit and total amount of debt that we're racking up, all of that is under the rosiest revenue. Uh, model we can possibly come up with, well, not possibly, I guess, but a very rosy revenue model as a percentage of GDP coming into the uh, uh, Treasury. So that, to me, is concerning because history would tell you, right, that the average amount of revenue coming in to the Treasury is 17.5%. So I say that, and then one last point here is like, so today we've got now 24 hours to review this omnibus spending bill. Uh, that's roughly $1.2 trillion, it's over 1,000 pages. And we've got to decide in the next 24 hours whether we're going to support it. Um, you probably can guess whether I'll support it or not. But uh, as we look ahead and, and look at the bill, it, my question for you is just this. You came to the negotiating tables along with the, the President of the United States and the administration with a certain set of priorities. And uh, Republican leadership in the House of Representatives came to the negotiating table with the White House and Chuck Schumer with a certain set of priorities. Yesterday, I saw reported at the Democrat caucus meeting the highlights from my Democratic colleagues that there's no poison pills on anti-abortion, LGBTQ, or DEI policy riders, significant increase in child care money, DOD climate resilience, humanitarian assistance, Afghan SIVs, increased Title I funding, rejected HR2 provisions. Would you say that you achieved the priorities that you wanted to achieve and that the president wanted to achieve in uh, your negotiations with the um, on the omnibus spending bill, I, I know we're over, but in, in my most thoughtful way, and I really mean this, is this the bill we would have written if it wasn't divided government? Absolutely not. I think this bill, and I mean this, is a reflection of divided government, and I certainly hope uh, it it passes because the alternative is a avoidable shutdown, uh, and I appreciate. Neither side got what they wanted. If you ask this side of the ledger, they're unhappy with a lot of things, too. Yield back, I thank the gentleman from Texas. Yield to the gentlelady from the great state of Texas, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Well, first of all, let me um, thank the director for um, years of service to this nation. We don't often uh, get a chance to speak positively to a person that is young, uh, but has a long history of service. Uh, we thank you for having that kind of record and being um, expert enough to have been on this side, the legislative side, and knowing the difficulty we have of trying to put a budget together or assessing the uh, executive's budget, because the whole question is about revenue uh, and to be able to ensure uh, that um, we have um, enough revenue coming in. So first I want to make a point. Um, I like gospel music, and in the aftermath of the George Floyd horrific killing, uh, a young uh, black boy either sang or wrote a song that said, I just want to live. It was a passionate, emotional song. I commend any of you to pull it up on YouTube or however. 
And it is a theme that I want to use, uh, that we are not trying to create an atmosphere where American families, no matter where they started in life, are just surviving, just barely making it. What we're looking for is um, the capacity to say that you are thriving. Uh, so my first question is, give me a sense, uh, not very long because my time is short, of our revenue source to be able to match uh, the president's vision and budget that makes us feel comfortable that we could go forward. Well, one, this budget would pay for all the president's new investments to help families thrive, as you say, to have childcare, to have paid leave, to have universal pre-K in this country, um, and also would achieve $3.2 trillion in deficit reduction uh, because he does ask the wealthiest in this country uh, to pay more. So in some of our proposals, uh, Congresswoman, not even back to levels before uh, the 2017 tax law. So we provide providing a path to show people we can invest in the American people and also achieve deficit reduction. So what you would be doing is that American families would be thriving as opposed to just surviving. That that would be the, the goal of a president's budget. I, I think, I would hope that's all our goals as we sit in these seats um, and we are put forth proposals we think uh, meet the bill to allow middle class and working families to thrive. One of the numbers I have is uh, corporations paying their fair share. And every time we use that terminology, it's like we're attacking corporate America. And this is one country that corporations flock to be able to come and build uh, their uh, growth. And I have a number that says if big corporations pay their fair share and the numbers may vary, we would get in an extra $2.2 trillion. Um, and again, that, that may be a number uh, that uh, can, can move. Uh, the budget includes an important proposal for so-called billionaires minimum income tax, which would not be painful, but would require the top 1% of households or those worth over $100 million to pay a minimum tax of, of 25%. So let me um, pose the question of how extensive will our commitment be to protecting Medicare and Medicaid, two different uh, lines of uh, payment. Uh, not payment, but two different lines of, um, of uh, treatment, if you will, Medicare versus Medicaid. But how would we, would we strengthen both of these in the president's budget? Uh, Medicare, uh, the proposal would uh, sustain Medicare and improve in, in solvency indefinitely. Um, again, uh, the wealthiest top 1% would go from paying 3.8% to 5%, a 1.2% difference. Uh, and that would take the Medicare trust fund into solvency indefinitely. That's not uh, the president's numbers. Those are the uh, CMS actuarialists, the, the professionals, the career uh, team that look at that. Uh, and so we believe uh, that expanded health care, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act is good for this country and good for the people of the country. And we have a budget uh, that would expand upon that. Part of us thriving is good health care which has really been an Achilles heel for our people for a long time. Let, with this few seconds that I have, let me just collectively get you to give an, an, a collective answer. We want better housing. We want child care. Uh, that has been one of my issues. Uh, and housing, affordable housing, made a commitment. Give me that as you close your remarks, and, and I have no more time. Uh, the housing ability and uh, child care. Programs, uh, housing, child care, uh, health care, energy costs, all those things that middle class and working families uh, need help with in this country, this budget would do it and pay for it. Right. I think that is clearly, uh, Mr. Chairman, a budget that has uh, the word thriving versus surviving. And I'm standing with the president's budget, and we will find a way to, to move forward on uh, moving America and America's families forward. Uh, lastly, I will just say moving people out of poverty. I want people who are poor to know that we are concerned about their status of poverty. I thank you very much, and I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. Gentlelady yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Utah for questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Director, Director Young, um, so I've, I've only been here two terms, uh, so relatively on the, the, the lower tenure. 
Uh, and other than witnesses that we've invited specifically, we'll obviously have a natural reason to chat with them. You're the only person that's ever really reached out. I'm sorry for this week on not being able to, to, to make that call scheduled, but I sincerely do appreciate it. And you may be able to tell uh, my, we've had a massive, we have massive catastrophic cold this week, um, to which my wife refers to as a man cold, um, where she also prophesies that I, everybody has to know about it too, which I guess I'm actually doing and fulfilling that prophecy at this very moment. Um, but I do appreciate that, and I and, and I look forward to as much dialogue as possible uh, in any moments that we we get to do that. That, mean, that means a lot. We, back back to my cold. <laughs> um, I, I I get to that point where when you have weeks like this, it's just a no nonsense type of moment. And to me, it's been mentioned several times. I, I've been really disappointed in the, the in, in a few a few weeks leading up to it, but the weeks after we passed the the, the fiscal commission act, uh, to see so much of the fear mongering going on about you know you know trying to get something done. Like we all recognize that we have a massive problem if we don't get ahead of our debt and deficit uh, woes that have that have persisted for. 25 plus years, and um, it's been really, really frustrating to watch. Uh, I don't really need you to expound on it. This isn't something you'd ever vote on. It may not even be heavily involved. I don't know to what extent, but my ask to you would be, could you help cut through? Would you be willing to commit to cut through all of the nonsense that's going on, the, the, the fear-mongering about Social Security, and it's just, just a cut to these programs. It's not. And the fear-mongering also from the right that this is just a way to sneak away and to increase tax. None of us want to sneak any taxes. My questions are all about tax. Would you be willing to commit to at least dialoguing in, in a, in a, in a, in a non-political tone among the folks that you interact with? Uh, Congressman, you have my commitment to do that. Look, there, there are different ways to dialogue. I appreciate some of, some of the hearings have, you know, it's five minutes. It's five minutes of yeah. back and forth. It doesn't really lend itself to, to real dialogue, but um, I'm open to having a, a conversation with you longer. I, I have lots of ideas on things. I've been around, um, and uh, you have my commitment to always be, av be available for those conversations. So... Um I, I, I questioned Secretary Yellen one time. I'll never forget when she responded, and I think it's such an easy way to, to, to grasp tax policy. Prior to the TCJA, taxes among many businesses were around the 35% range. We lowered them to 28, 21. It's easy to just split the difference. Do you have any specific analysis that can point or prove that raising the corporate tax rate in this current environment, in this current environment, won't impose burdens on low and middle income Americans, and won't be putting our companies at a at a disadvantage globally by raising that tax rate up seven percent. So, uh, thank you, Congressman. One, you know that we used to have about two percent of our GDP uh, from corporate tax rates. We're down about one percent. Other uh, global uh, economies that are in our peer group have about 3% of their GDP from corporate tax rates. So we believe we are underachieving in corporate tax rates. We also have to remember something Secretary Yellen has worked on, the global tax minimum. Some countries have actually taken us up on that proposal. Our budget asked Congress to do that. We believe it uh, uh, prevents companies from looking to offshore to hurt our American workers. Uh, and countries have signed on and done that to make sure you can't just go to a third country and hide from your tax obligations. So we think those proposals mean we ensure that our corporations don't offshore, which they're doing today, uh, and they pay uh, what they're supposed to, and we bring our corporate tax rates as a percentage of GDP back to its historic norm, not my, even what other countries are doing. My biggest fear of this is this just becomes an arbitrary number, and let's just split the difference. And I know there's industry out there uh, that, 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 that skirt by and that others are going to be hit really hard with a 28% tax increase. And these are good, hardworking American brick and mortar type companies that will, will drastically be affected. I want to just ask one more thing. 99% um, of businesses are categorized as small businesses, 500 or fewer employees. They do their taxes, though, oftentimes on an individual basis. Raising the tax rate 
to exactly 39.6%. Will that affect these small businesses if that's how they do their taxes and so many companies do? Uh, we don't believe so. Uh, and speaking of this president's policy over the last three years, he is committed to small businesses. We believe his policies are the reason we've seen over 16 million new business applications filed during his first three years. Uh, and we're committed. Our SBA budget speaks to this. Uh, I know you're short on time. I won't go, go into our proposals, but we are truly committed you're absolutely right there, the backbone of our economy. What we're talking about is going after those uh, high value, high earning corporate corporations, not small businesses. We are on a strong economic recovery, but we still have TCJA in place. And I wanna just make sure that point is made. That can't be overlooked. Thank you, Chairman, I yield back. Apologize for going over. Gentleman yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. Gentleman from Kansas is recognized for five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, Director Young, I want to thank you for uh, being with us here today to uh, you know, answer our questions and, and try to provide some insight into the President's budget request. One of the, before I, I talk about some of the budget things I want to talk about, I wanted to uh, uh, correct the record on uh, something. I, I guess you'd stated to uh, Representative Klein that the President would not sign a bill raising taxes on those making under $400,000. But uh, the President, uh, President Biden has already signed a bill raising taxes on those making under $400,000. In fact, according to the uh, Congressional Budget Office and the Joint Committee on Taxation, the uh, so-called Inflation Reduction Act reduced, uh, raised taxes on those under $400,000 by over $4 billion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record this letter from the Congressional Budget Office dated August 25th, 2022, uh, to uh, uh, Ranking Member Kevin Brady and Ranking Member uh, Jason Smith. Without objection, so ordered. Um, you know, it's, it's not really a concern that some of my Republican colleagues have uh, major concerns about the proposal we're talking about today, uh, from the uh, anti-growth tax increases to expanding the D.C. bureaucracies. Uh, there's a lot for us not to like in the budget. Um, and, but I want to focus my questions on something that, at least outside the hearing, is something I think there's bipartisan support that's certainly growing uh, and that's namely addressing our fiscal crisis and where we are. Uh, Director Young, I'm sure you're aware that our country's borrowing roughly $95,000 a second. And that's more than the median income of uh, an individual in Kansas and uh, for the household income. And so, you know, in just literally one second, the federal debt increased $95,000. And Democrats and Republicans all agree this is uh, dangerously unsustainable. And I'm part of a bipartisan group that's working to address this. And uh, even some of my colleagues on the other side of the dais have talked about this, this devastating problem. Yet in the president's budget request, there's not really any meaningful way to address this crisis. Uh, even worse, the president's uh, proposed tax increases, which uh, aren't even offsetting the new spending that he's proposing. And it seems like the, the plan is to have a continued deficit and continuing growing that debt. Um, I know that uh, sometimes in the D.C. doublespeak, it's easy to say that uh, uh, the president likes to talk about his deficit was, uh, is reduced. Uh, in reality, though, just because you propose a large deficit that's less than a larger deficit that had been proposed before, that's not a cut. Uh, it still increases the debt. And in fact, our national debt's going to increase to $52.7 trillion in 10 years based on this budget uh, from a already staggering $34.5 trillion. So where can you help with us, uh, help us understand where the president's priority are on, on our fiscal health of the nation and, and particularly uh, why he didn't propose balancing the budget uh, if we truly do have a strong economic recovery? Uh, Congressman, uh, one, I wanna make sure we are not conflating deficit and debt uh, the president has, in fact, when he began, the deficits are over a trillion dollars lower than when he began. Uh, yeah, but, I, but let's not confuse the COVID spending that Republicans and Democrats agreed to uh, for that disaster. And, you know, when I look at, so if we, if we take out COVID and we take out uh, the extra spending there and we just look for the next 10 years uh, from what the president, President Biden has proposed, it actually is increasing the debt. So he's spending more money every year than he's bringing in. Well, Congressman, from the amount that was being spent, 
outlays in the government when this president took office to now, there has been a, over a trillion dollars of deficit reduction. I appreciate you don't want to count that base because we're in the middle of COVID, but just as you don't want to do that, I don't want people to, to forget where we were. And he led a successful vaccine campaign and ensured that we had one of the strongest economic uh, recover than any other major economy in this world. Wow. Hey, he, he was the beneficiary of the uh, Operation Warp Speed that President Trump put in place, and uh, that uh, started rolling out uh, before President Biden came into office and, and was actually helping make that economy get started. And, and, and I think we can all agree, even Alexander Han Hamilton uh, brought up that, uh, you know, the necessity for borrowing during a particular emergency cannot be doubted. Uh, but I'm just looking forward. I mean, over the next 10 years, the president looks and proposes increasing our debt instead of lowering our debt in what's supposedly strong economic time. Yeah, in, in five seconds, I'll say he has shown a path. I get there was disagreement on how we get there uh, by asking the wealthiest to pay more, shown a path to three, over $3 trillion of deficit reduction. And the risk is, you've asked me about a balanced budget, the risk is uh, that programs like Social Security, like Medicare, like Medicaid, like the Affordable Care Act, those are where the government has most of its outlays. If you want to balance in a short amount of time, there's no other place to go but to, well, to for those to come down. Yeah, and I, I, I know my time's run out, but I, the debt does increase. That's the fact of the matter is the President Biden's budget proposal is going to increase the debt over the next 10 years. And unfortunately, my time's run out. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the gentlelady from Minnesota. Five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and Director Young. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to just point out a couple of things. President Biden's budget seems to really cater to the fringes of the party, um, without taking into consideration uh, what's best for the American people. And uh, just this week, the EPA announced a new rule, effectively forcing consumers to buy electric vehicles over gas. And it's, it's flawed for so many reasons. And I'm from a rural area. And, you know, first of all, the electrical grid may not be able to handle all of these changes. It will increase our reliance on China as they control the EV battery and mineral supply chain. The auto, the auto industry made it clear that this plan is going to hurt them. Um, and this kind of switch may actually be nearly impossible for rural America. Um, where people regularly drive long distances and there are fewer charging stations and there's a real concern about the performance of the batteries in cold weather. Uh, we saw that uh, not that long ago. Um, so I'm just kind of curious as to how much of the funding in the president's budget between the increases for the EPA and the Department of Energy will be used to produce agency rules that remove everyday consumer goods such as the gas-powered cars, gas stoves, and gas furnishes from the marketplace, because it really seems like there's been a lot of rules that are affecting people like with those kinds of things. Uh, Congresswoman, the bill released last night that hopefully you'll be voting on Friday, I think speaks to uh, the fact that no one is going to be banning gas stoves um, as far as Okay, well then take that part of it out of it. Say, okay, so what are the rules going to be on the on the cars? We'll take the gas stoves out, gas furnaces. Well, EPA finalized, I think you're referring to the tailpipe rule. Now uh, let the EPA administrator speak to the details of the tailpipe rule. But from an investment standpoint, ensuring that communities uh, have the charging stations they need to make this transition, because we believe climate change is an existential crisis to the budget. Um, look how much we spend on disasters that we are putting the infrastructure in place uh, in order to support uh, more electric vehicles to ensure that uh, we do something about climate change. But does it address at all those issues that I mentioned? Driving long distances, um, you know, the performance of a, of a battery. I mean, we saw, I saw it on the news um, two months ago, I think it was, well, where these batteries were not performing and people were being stuck and they couldn't get them charged. And, and there are huge issues with those, but they can, but these departments, and the question was about how much are they going to commit to those, writing these rules? And, and maybe, you know, maybe you just talk about in general because there's been just a proliferation of these rules that are banning things and really getting at things because obviously they can't get them passed through the through Well, the I, I just th uh, think, um, what I said is if the questions are specific on tailpipe rule, 
Um, I will let EPA explain its own rule, but I will say uh, as far as infrastructure, we do have budget, uh, budget space through the Inflation Reduction Act to make sure we have the infrastructure to deal with those issues you just pointed out, people who need more charging stations. I'm also from a town of less than 2,000. Uh, we want to see that infrastructure. Uh, rural communities should not be left behind. Uh, last time I went to my home state, I saw charging stations in places, uh, frankly, I never thought I'd see charging stations in. So that work is happening uh, all across this country. There's more to do, and we're committed to making those investments. Will there be, I mean, in the budget that the, that the president has uh, proposed, does it allow, I mean, how much of it is going to be used to write those rules that infringe on people's uh, ability to make consumer choices? Well, or we, any don't, of the rules. we don't believe our regulatory uh, actions infringe. We think they improve different points of, of life for Americans. Um, specifically about tailpipe, we think it's going to lead a, 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 hugely to the need to address emissions uh, in this country, and I appreciate their difference, opinions, difference of opinions, um, but also health. Uh, outcomes of children who suffer from asthma. Uh, there's a reason uh, the, the Lung Association and other healthcare organizations supported that rule. Um, but agency budgets are in here that support rulemaking. Uh, EPA's uh, operations account certainly supports uh, employees who do that rulemaking. I have an office. And I'm going to have to reclaim my time yep. because I do have one follow up question um, and I'm almost out of time. I wasn't paying attention. Um, how much, you know, there's, there's, Obviously, these switches, whether it be gas stove, you know, uh, battery power, uh, EVs, how does the president's budget account for the cost to the consumer, to those middle class families? Because EVs are still very expensive. You know, it could pretend the cost of changing a stove over or any of those items um, is expensive. No, and no how one do we has account any, for it? Yeah, no one has any intention of banning. Uh, gas stoves, okay, uh, but but the other a, programs, yes, that, but that is why the Inflation Reduction Act uh, provided tax credits for Americans who want to buy. Uh, but if they can't even vehicles. afford it, if they can't begin to afford it, I mean, uh, the tax credits are one thing, but they can't even start to afford these things, and and I don't understand how we are going to continue to impose these. Uh, ridiculous rules and uh, things on people, but I am out of time. Generally, his time has expired. Time to recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Burkeen, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I jumped in front of the chairman on that, but, but thank you very much. Um, Director Young, I appreciate you being here. Um, I want to provide some quotes uh, from uh, former President Bill Clinton. Uh, a decade ago, Clinton stated that he raised the corporate tax to reduce the deficit. Specifically, he stated, quote, I raised the corporate tax to international average to make a contribution to drive down the debt, end of quote. Uh, similarly, uh, in 1993, President Clinton, um, advocating for the BTU tax, in his own words, he said he was advocating for it, quote, as the best way to provide us with revenue to lower the deficit. So you notice in both those quotes, one was, I'm doing this about the debt, I'm doing this about the deficit. Democrats once held a goal to reduce deficit loading with their tax increases. Um, in this budget uh, proposed by President Biden that you're managing over, the leader of the Democrat Party, President Biden, wants to increase taxes by $5 trillion in this budget, but I don't see it being used at all to, to reduce the deficit. Let me kind of back that up. According to the CBO, the debt held by the public will increase by $18 trillion if nothing changes. That's the CBO baseline from current spending habits. Um, with this plan, with the Biden plan, $5 trillion is going to be raised in taxes, um, tax increases, yet the $18 trillion in additional debt loading over the 10-year window will also occur. That means with y'all's budget, with Biden's budget, $5 trillion worth of tax increases borne by Americans over the next 10 years will go to increase spending, but it, it does nothing to address deficits and debt. Um, and so, you know, you know, I, I appreciate anyone who wants to talk about hypocrisy among the Republican Party. I welcome that. So I want to say this subtly and tactfully. I just want you to, and just, this is kind of a rhetorical question. Where did the ideology of Bill Clinton for, for, for presidents 
the ideology of, of Democrat presidents go where once upon a time they would say, we want tax increases, but we're going to use it because we really think that debt and deficits um, are an issue. Tax increases, spending increases, and yet no deficit reduction is in President Biden's plan. He has said, President Biden said, show me your budget and I will show you your values. The Biden administration values in this are clear. I don't, I don't see deficit and debt reduction as, as, a, as a part of, of true emphasis. Radical tax and spend, no deficit reduction. When, when Democrat-leaning constituents back home ask me, while we don't raise taxes on the top 1% to pay down the debt, I go through some, some stats to back up what has been twisted about what they're told. According to the Tax Foundation, the top 1% already pay 46% of all income taxes. That's the top revenue stream coming into the Fed. 46% of all income taxes are already borne by the top 1%. Further, you take the top 50% of all income earners, they pay 97% of all income taxes. That means that the bottom 50% of income earners pay 2.3% of all taxes. So, so this, this tax the wealthy mentality, we've got to make sure that people understand the stats and the truth of those stats. The Democrats in Oklahoma think that this administration would raise taxes to address debt loading, but this budget shows that debt and deficit reduction is not really a priority for you all. That is a radical ideology that is leading this administration, and again, tactfully, that really saddens me. Um, again, I ask you, where has the ideology of Bill Clinton gone for this Democrat president and what 30 years ago, Democrats were focused on debt and deficit spending. Look, both parties are to blame. Um, Republicans, I'll be the first to chastise us when we talk about um, fiscal discipline, and we don't adhere to it, but I'm doing this subtly just to say, man, I'm concerned about where the Democrat Party has drifted on once being so focused on debt and deficit. Let me kind of close with this. This budget, it has radical climate priorities and in the increased five trillion in spending. Housing cost increases. The budget calls for a new program that seeks to provide families with $10,000 total mortgage credit over the next two years. That proposal is going to cost $47 billion. That's totally unpaid for deficit spending, adding on the $34 trillion. It's going to lead to an increase in home prices because deficit spending drives inflation, devaluation of our currency. That's where interest rates are coming from, the interest rate increase. The cost of median homes on average right now are $100,000 more. You look at different statistics than they were before President Biden took office. The average median house is $100,000 more, yet, yet the average income for these same families in the last three years has only risen by about $10,000. The average 30-year mortgage is almost $1,000 more under, before this administration to, to now. So I'm going to wrap it up by saying this. I believe your budget is compounding the problems you claim to, to say you're trying to fix. Where is this administration's focus on debt and de deficit reduction? Page 139 of the budget. Deficit reduced by $3 trillion from baseline to policy. The debt number on policy on baseline is $48.3 trillion in 2034. Policy, $45.1 trillion, $3 trillion less. In, in all due respect, the 10-year window of CBO says 18.9 is where we're going to be. Because they don't look at policy. They look at baseline. But y'all's budget says we're going to be at 18.2. I mean, it, it's $18 trillion with y'all's budget versus CBO. And so to, to try to wordsmith these different numbers... I just don't see the I appreciate the, value of the exchange. Thank you, it's Mr. Chairman. A good one. I wish we could continue it, but in the interest of time, let's go to our uh, uh, colleague from the great state of Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, congratulations for leading the first bipartisan budget process reform, I think, ever on the floor of the House of Representatives. It's truly a remarkable achievement. I, I do have two unanimous consent requests. Unanimous, unanimous consent that the report from the Texas Public Policy Fund Foundation finding that Medicaid recipients actually have worse health outcomes compared to the uninsured. And then a second one, a unanimous consent that a memo from the Joint Committee on Taxation concerning that 54% of the Inflation Reduction Act's expanded subsidies will go to people making over 400% of the federal with that budget. objection so ordered thank you <clears throat> and first off Greg young thank you for the call prior to this meeting I, just an editorial comment because i heard the back and forth on the uh, on the uh, 
EVs and the charging stations. I've been a student of the hybrid technology since 2004, a consumer of hybrid technology since the first Toyota car came out with that in the early 2000s. And it strikes me that we've, we've missed the mark here by trying to force the entire country to go completely from internal combustion engine to electric vehicles suddenly is, um, is perhaps not the best strategy. And were the resources directed toward hybrid technology, plug-in hybrid technology, the resources required to make one big electronic vehicle battery that can go 300 miles between charges could actually be used to make, what, four, five, six, or seven batteries in the plug-in hybrid technology. And it just seems like that would be a much more rational use of resources. I know you do not direct uh, policy at the Department of Energy, but I also know as Director of Office of Management of the Budget, you get to review all of the rules before their final promulgation. So I, I just add that for what it's worth, that we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't exclude hybrid technology, even though it does involve an internal combustion engine. It is a, uh, I mean, I'll just tell you, it's unbelievable to get 55 miles to the gallon uh, on, in, a, in, a, in a regular hybrid car. <clears throat> the last car I bought was a plug-in, not a plug-in, but just a regular hybrid pickup truck made by Ford Motor Company. And I'm astounded at how the hybrid technology has improved since the last hybrid car I bought in 2018. And even though it's not a plug-in hybrid, it does run a significant amount of time just on electricity only, vastly increasing the, uh, the miles per gallon uh, that's indicated. L let me just also, I need to get this off my chest. 1993 in September, Paul Songus came to Dallas, Texas and talked about healthcare. And the president had just delivered a very famous joint address to Congress on health care. The Health Security Act was, was going to be unveiled and, and given to Congress, and that was going to be passed by the Congress, he thought. Mr. Songus, former Senator Songus, told us in Dallas that if we were not careful, this new bill from the president proposed five new entitlement programs, and we couldn't afford the ones we already had. And I was actually astounded to hear him admit that. And he further went on to talk about if we don't do something about our automatic spending, entitlement spending, mandatory spending, however you want to phrase it, but if we don't reapproach that, he projected in 20 years time, I, obviously we're already past that point, but we are also reaching a point where we realize the debt is we're pay, paying more for interest on the national debt than we are for defense. And at some point, there will be an intergenerational conflict because the people coming up who are paying the taxes are not going to be willing to support the people who are being supported. I'd just like to have your opinion on that. Uh, I think I've spoken around what you're looking for my opinion on, so it's not gonna be earth shattering here. Um, how we got here, I appreciate hearing your perspective. Um, I, I, I wasn't um, following politics in, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, but where we are now is people depend on many of these programs, uh, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, there is no plan B if we don't figure out a way yeah, to let, ensure let just their reclaim longevity. My time, let me reclaim my time briefly because we're going to run out. The problem is the people who are coming up, who are going to replace us, will be voting on these same things, and their constituents will tell them, we can't carry that load any longer, and I hope that we can do something before we reach that crisis point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield I back. appreciate that exchange. Uh, thank you, uh, Director and uh, the gentleman from Texas. We yield five minutes now to our friend, Mr. Bobby Scott from uh, Virginia. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> And thank you for being here, Director Young. The President's fiscal year 2025 budget exemplifies the point that I've made frequently that Democrats routinely prioritized reducing deficits without sacrificing the safety net programs that are so important. 
point out that every Democratic president since President Kennedy has left office with a better, has left for their Republican successors a better deficit situation than they inherited without exception, and every Republican administration since Nixon has left for the Democrats a worse situation than they inherited. President Trump was well on his way to fulfilling that trend even before the pandemic. So, Director Young, does the president's budget project a deficit larger or smaller than the deficit he inherited from President Trump? Well, it is factually accurate that the deficit is a trillion dollars lower uh, than when the president took office. It's factually accurate that he worked with then Speaker McCarthy uh, and signed a bill, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, to save another trillion dollars over 10 years. And it's factually accurate uh, that deficits would reduce in his budget by $3.2 trillion while also uh, paying for the new proposals he has in his budget. Thank you. Now, uh, the Republican uh, budget has significant cuts, particularly to education. Can you uh, tell me what the president's budget has for Title I, which supports school-serving low-income students? Uh, well, one, thank you for your leadership on Title I, your leadership on education and labor issues. Uh, this budget provides $18.6 billion for Title I. As you know, that is the main federal way to provide uh, resources uh, to public schools in this country. Uh, it's $200 million over 2023 levels. There's probably a new level out since uh, the 24 bill was released uh, overnight. But this president's committed uh, to ensuring Title I has been underfunded uh, more than years, uh, probably decades, and we need to ensure that the federal government is a partner, a small partner. Uh, frankly, local taxes, local school districts provide most, um, but this is a way for the federal government to ensure uh, that some of those communities who don't have high tax bases have good, ad more than adequate good education. Uh, the uh, American Rescue Plan provided significant funds and that was distributed by the Title I formula. There was a piece on NPR yesterday morning showing how valuable those resources were. So I appreciate uh, that answer. Under the American Rescue Plan, uh, the child tax credit uh, was made fully refundable. The result was cutting child poverty nearly in half. We uh, House passed a budget that had a child tax credit nowhere nearly as um, robust as what we passed in the American Rescue Plan. Can you tell me what the president's budget has for a child tax credit? Uh, we would uh, support, and the president has included uh, yet again the full tax, child tax care proposal uh, that mirrors what was in the uh, the ARP bill uh, passed at the beginning of his administration, which we saw lead to a reduction of half of child poverty in this country. Thank you. Um, the um my uh, district includes a lot of shipbuilding, uh, Nupanu Shipbuilding, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, many other uh, small and medium repair yards. What does the president's budget do for shipbuilding, particularly the um, Australian-UK-US agreement? Uh, the budget complies with the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, so Department of Defense complies with that, but we were able to make the key investments necessary to keep our agreements, like AUKUS that you're referring to with the Australians. Also, this budget provides $1.7 billion more uh, in Navy accounts uh, in the submarine industrial base to increase submarine production uh, rates and operational availability, increases the Columbia-class submarine procurement funding by $2.3 billion, 31% more than was previously uh, planned. Uh, and finally, we include $1.6 billion to procure a San Antonio-class amphibious warship. Uh, we also have, knowing this bill had to comply with the FRA, have a future year's budget that shows our commitment uh, to shipbuilding in this country. And frankly, we need the supplemental also to be a companion to the budget, uh, which has uh, robust funding to invest in our, uh, our submarine industrial base in this country to increase production capability. Thank you. And the projections forward are very important to the industrial base. A lot of businesses might go out of business if they're not convinced that they'll have contracts in the future. So yeah, I appreciate it's that. not just buying the ship, it's increasing the production capability. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Virginia and yield now five minutes to my friend from Georgia, Buddy Carter. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Young, thank you for being here. I know it's been a long day. I'll try to be quick and concise on what, I, what I'm concerned about. And um, the first thing I'm concerned about is that this budget is five weeks late. Now, granted, this is not the only president who has been late with his budget. But I hope that the administration understands that that puts us behind. We, we want to be on time. Now, granted, we may not be on time. But when we start behind, then we're already behind. That's why I've submitted, um, or why I have legislation called the Submit Act, send us budget materials, international tactics in time. And what it does is it says that if the president, Republican, Democrat, whoever, doesn't send Congress a budget in time, that they, they're not gonna be invited to, to give a State of the Union address. And, and again, it doesn't apply to a Democratic president, or only it, it applies to any president. So I just want you to take the message back that we really need this information on time. And I hope you understand what I'm coming from from that. I'm very concerned about the debt, as everyone is. Uh, right, right now, we are spending in this country $202,000 every second. The speed of light is only 186 miles per second. We're spending money faster than the speed of light. I know you have concerns about the, the deficit, too. Tell me what your concerns are about the deficit. Uh, Mr. Carter, since you're at the end, hopefully the chairman will uh, let us go back and forth a little. But I have to say, you, you give me a budget by October 1st, I'll give you a budget that's on time. Um, with all due respect, it puts us very behind on production for budgets when they are six months late. I'm sitting here trying to get a readout of a bill that was released this morning that finishes the budget from last year while also presenting the budget for next year. So I think speaking of process, Mr. Chairman, uh, we all need to work together to find some way uh, to get this back on track. So I appreciate your bill, but it's part of so part you, of So you can't, you can't start your budget for next year until we finish ours we, for this we, year? We actually made a decision not to wait any further. No, that was your decision, though. But, but you, can make, you can submit the budget for next fiscal year. Yeah. If you talk to the appropriators, it is very frustrating, I've been on that side, to get a budget that's frankly out of date. So okay. they're going to get a okay. bunch of tables that are compared to wrong numbers. So it does put us behind, Mr. Carter. Also, on, on debt and deficits, while you may disagree with our tax policies uh, going after higher income earners, it does allow us to pay for our new investments in this budget and have an over $3 trillion deficit reduction path. And obviously, you know we disagree with that. You know that, that we, we would refute that point. Nevertheless, let's talk about rulemaking. Do you, when you make, I believe right now, there are 170 regulations currently pending before your office. Whenever you make these rules and approve these rules, do you ever take into consideration the cost of these rules? Oh, Mr. Carter, that's the whole reason... Uh, OMB gets any rule. For OMB to get a rule from an agency, it's the agency's rule. So when EPA has a rule, it's their rule. The reason uh, OMB is involved in our OIR office is because we have estimated that it has a certain economic impact. So we think it's important. Administration since Bill Clinton have set the rules for what comes into OMB and it's because we think economically significant rules should come and have a larger... Well, let, let me ask you about two in particular. I, I have the honor and privilege of representing the entire coast of Georgia. And up and down the Atlantic seaboard, of course, we have right whales. And there's a rule right now being proposed by NOAA to, to require sh uh, boats between 35 and 65 feet to adhere to a 10-mile-per-hour or 10-mile-per-hour speed limit, which is going to just crush recreational fishing. It's going to have a negative impact on our, on our ports. We have two major seaports in my district. That's, that's one of the examples, and it's going to impact, in my district alone, 27,000 di 27, direct jobs. Nationwide, that number is up to 340,000. It'll have an economic impact of $84 billion. Yet this administration, and, and, and NOAA specifically, laughingly says it's only going to have $46 million impact. That's one example of the kind of rule that I'm talking about that has a negative impact on our economy. Another one, I chair the subcommittee on environment and, and energy and commerce. The, the NACS rule that's being proposed here for particulate matter, that is going to have a devastating, devastating impact 
on manufacturers here in America. What does the administration do with, with these types of rules? Do y'all look at these types of rules and the impact that they'll have economically? Absolutely. That is entirely why OMB is involved. Anything that's economically significant, uh, which that rule was, has to come to make sure that nothing's rushed through, that we take public comment, and we made it easier in the Biden administration to walk in off the street and provide comment because we want to hear, and rules do change based on those comments. So I look forward to rules. So there are times when you would just, there are you telling me that, well, I hope that this right well rule and I hope that this ambient air quality rule will be two of those times that they change. Yeah, I can't comment on, on specific rules, but absolutely rules uh, after listening I'll to the I'll give you the final have, word. I'll give you yeah, the final ha word. Yeah, have changed. And that's the point of public comment. Uh, we don't know everything until these rules go out and people have a chance to look at them and we take in information uh, from the public. Other agencies might have some equities that they don't know. Uh, so, you know, OMBOR's role is to make sure we hear from all stakeholders and make sure we're striking the well, right Well, I've time. given you two examples. I hope you'll look at those for us. I and, think, and I yield back. Thank I think you. the gentleman uh, from Georgia now yields to our... A final member for comment and question, Mr. Trone from Maryland for five minutes. I thank Chairman Arrington for um, holding this hearing, and I'm happy to close it out and let the director and her team be on their way, on their way. Hey, anything else you want to get out that you want to answer to previous questions? You're good? No, sir, I'm good. Okay, I'm always here if you need some time. <laughs> okay, hey, uh, I was really pleased to see the president's budget uh, set a 25% minimum tax on the wealthiest 0.01%, and raising the corporate tax rate, 15 to 21 minimum. Fantastic. Quadruple stock buybacks, fantastic. And closes the tax loopholes, all the while lowering the tax rates for lower and middle ass income. For many years, America's richest corporations have used tax loopholes to pay for lower tax rates than the average American. In 2020, 55 of the largest corporations paid no federal income tax at all, according to the Institute of Taxation Economic Policy. To put that in perspective, if Amazon, just Amazon, was asked to pay the U current U.S. tax rate of 21%, that'd be enough SNAP benefits for 1.7 million Americans facing hunger. That's a pretty good trade-off. Amazon can certainly afford that. Jeff Bezos can easily afford it. Good Lord. If it's clear America doesn't have a spending problem, we've got a revenue problem. And that's what you guys are working to correct, and we appreciate that. So can you elaborate for a minute on the impact of raising corporate income tax in rates and closing these tax loopholes, cheating loopholes, will have on down paying the deficit? And of course, ensuring that our teachers, our firefighters, never again pay a higher tax rate than the most wealthy. I mean, Congressman Trone, given your, your uh, business history and, and success, hearing your perspective um, uh, makes one sit up uh, and, and know that these uh, tax policies uh, asking large corporations uh, and uh, the top one and two percent uh, will indeed not impact the investments those companies are able to make in this country. If anything, it will ensure we are able to provide investments uh, in programs that middle class and working families need to expand our economy. And I keep coming back to child care. Uh, this is not spending. When you talk about spending, this is an investment uh, to grow our economy, bring more people who now can't join the workforce into the workforce, all through these tax fairness proposals, frankly. Uh, we had a OMB and CEA report uh, that said, uh, uh, 400 billionaires, the richest 400 billionaires, paid just 8% uh, in their tax rate from 2010 to 2018. <laughs> um, something has to be done, and this president's putting forth a proposal to do that. Yeah, could be much clearer. Something has to be done that's absolutely outrageous. And government businesses don't make decisions on investment, which creates the jobs based on the tax rate. I've made, in my past life, hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions each year on budgets and to build new buildings, build enter new states. And not one time ever in the history of my life did I say, what's the tax rate next year? What you look at is, can you compete? Can you do it better than the other competitor? And with that, can you create a P&L statement that works? 
and the tax rate, that's after the p &L. It's never, ever once been a consideration. So this Republican jigaboo that, you know, it's a tax rate that's stopping business investment, it's just completely faulty by people who have never run a business. They've never been there. They have not a clue what they're talking about. You know, child care, as you said, unaffordable, unattainable for many moms, caregivers. Yet the high quality early childhood care, that's how we get equity, equity across our nation. Talk a little bit more about that because I'm really excited about the child income tax credit, the child care, care information, also the work you're doing on how we get pre-K everywhere. Then we gotta think about the three-year-olds, how we get them in full day in our public school system because we know that's going to pay us dividends later. You spend money to bring in more revenue down the road. We know kids who have access to quality pre-K three and four, um, their graduation rates go up, they have a better chance of getting going to college and getting a college degree, uh, which we still believe is a pathway to middle class. That, uh, and those are, those are facts. And again, it goes back to a budget, those investments. We can send kids at three and four to school. Now my child decided to be born a month late to go to pre-K three, so I'll be paying exorbitant childcare fees for another year. Uh, but parents should have access to affordable childcare. We have a proposal that says uh, some parents shouldn't pay more than $10 a day to quality affordable childcare. We need pre-K, uh, we need a full suite of solutions. This budget provides it. Director, thank you for all your hard work and God bless. Take the rest of the day off, hopefully. Another hearing, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Maryland, and uh, we are now at the end where I, uh, I want to make just a few closing comments. I know you've been here a good bit of time. I appreciate you uh, taking the questions from my colleagues, um, and you are a good person, and I've, I like you, and I like working with you. As I said when I, at the beginning, I like you. I do not like the president's budget. And I hate what I think the budget would do to this country, which is more of what has happened the last few years. Uh, I don't think Republicans have all the answers. And I don't think there are things that Democrats propose that uh, should be dismissed out of hand. And I think most of the big problems, quite frankly, will only be solved when Democrats and Republicans get in a room, hash it out, find consensus, which is why I'm so interested in a bipartisan fiscal commission. I don't have much hope uh, in this institution, it, it's, a, it's a long shot. It may not work, but the current dynamic isn't working either. Um, but, but we do at least have this sort of belief system, as I said, this set of policies that reflect the values of my Democrat colleagues who have the best of intentions and my Republican colleagues. But here's one thing we can't disagree on. And so the American people can look at the president's budget, see the belief system, and vote accordingly. Same way with, the, with in, uh, the, the Republicans, balanced budget blueprint. Uh, so it's there for everybody to see now. We've marked ours up, the president has submitted his, this is how it ought to work. Um, and uh, the people will, will make those decisions in November. But here's what's not for debate. The unsustainability of the path that we're on. And this is what I wanna say to you from, from really from my heart, in the deepest, uh, with the deepest concern for our country's future. Both parties have contributed to the mess we're in, no doubt. I do not give my Republican colleagues and my party a pass for where we are today, where we're going, which, which could be catastrophic. I don't have to recite the numbers to you, Ms. Young, you know them well, but CBO just came out with a 30-year projection so they gave us the 20 trillion that will be added to the debt on, in, with current policies over 10. We're already paying more, almost a trillion in interest, more than we pay in defense for our national defense. But in 30 years, it's gonna be about 150 trillion. And the share of that per family will go from about 250,000 to a million. And our annual annual deficit, which is almost two trillion now, will be over seven trillion in thirty years. And think about that, Mr. Trone. Just think about that as a business guy. We're going to spend seventy-five percent of our seven trillion 
in what we borrow to fund this government on interest alone, not on a safety net, not on sailors and soldiers, not on climate policy and programs. I mean, pick your thing. Let's debate those, those programs. Let's debate those strategies to solve problems that the American people uh, believe we ought to be responsible in doing. But we got to pay for this. Because, and I, I'm just quoting you back, and I'm, this isn't one of those to put it back on you, but you, you made a good, I think it's a statement that a lot of people believe here. We don't tax citizens on the debt. Yeah, we tax our children on the debt. Debt is a deferred tax on our kids. And it is not only not courageous, it's immoral for both sides to leave us on this unsustainable path. So just find it in your heart and push hard while you're still serving our country and this president to encourage your colleagues on the Democrat side, as I encourage my Republican colleagues, to get in a room, so to speak, hash it out, and let's, let's save this country. Because if this tips into a sovereign debt crisis, I, I believe that it will undermine everything good about the country, everything. The greatest economy in the world, the greatest military in the world, our leadership in the world, and, and most importantly, and I know Mr. Trone believes this, our children's future here. That's why we're here. So um, I appreciate Mr. Trone, I appreciate my Democrat and Republican colleagues, and I appreciate you and your service. So uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for committing so much time to the Budget Committee. God bless America, right? God bless America. Um, and with that, we have just uh, the questions. Uh, members can submit their written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers may, will be part of the formal uh, hearing record. Any members who wish to submit questions or any extraneous material for the record may do so within seven days. And want the record to reflect that Mr. Trone is still here. When the, when the buzzer goes off and the gavel goes down, that the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>